What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei back with Reborn as Super Lion and Lion King. Part 2. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel, and for more exclusive content. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. So let me get this straight you three grew up together as the king's servants and Simba was the queen. Hamu asked while scratching his head with his tail. No no, they were slaves, and the queen attacked them and made everyone think they died. But who got scarred? Imani said. No no no, they are twins and happened to know who Simba and Asafa are, then they thought that they died. So they scarred the king. Pumba tried to make them understand. Guys calm down, nothing has changed, I'm still me it's just that I used to be childhood friends with these two. And the king died so me and Simba had escaped because we believed that we were the guilty. Asafa tried to explain. I see wait you killed the king. Taiman flew up in fear, after all, if Simba and Asafa were criminals, and he shielded them from lions nonetheless. Knew it's not like that, no wonder your brain didn't develop if you grew up with these people. Ayana said angrily, dragging down everyone including Asafa. Hey, I'm the great leader Hamu, it is anyone's honor to be with me. Hamu complained. Asafa. You need to return and take your place as king. Nala suddenly turned to Asafa and spoke in a serious tone. Their home is on the brink of never being able to recover. KK King times four as the crew shouted in surprise. Ha 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 lady, now I'm sure you've got the wrong person, Asafa. King. PFFTS, I've been teaching this brat manners since he was in diapers, there's no way he's king, right Asafa. Imani said in a chuckle. Right Asafa. Seeing no response, she asked again. No, Nala is right I am a prince. Asafa said with some guilt. He never told such an important part of his identity, although he trusted them dearly, it was more to do with the fact that he didn't want anything to do with his past. But now that fact had changed. They all dropped their jaws. Taiman looked like he was thinking hard about something. But you don't want to return right? Pumba asked with worry in his tone. Asafa was like his little brother, they had become family. No, I don't. Asafa said to the surprise of everyone. Asafa you have to. Ayana cried out, if he refuses, then they'd be doomed. The crew breathed out in relief. But I have to. Asafa said making all of them per cup. My uncle has destroyed my homeland, and as the rightful king I have to return and take my place as king. Asafa said, making all of them look at him in both sorrow and admiration. They had never seen him with such a resolve. The kid has grown time and solacely claimed. Taiman, you once said that one should leave the past behind them, but my past has come to confront me. It's standing right in front of me should I turn away and leave everyone to die. Or should I stand and help those that I care about? Asafa challenged Taiman on his philosophy with a question that he knew would make Taiman understand. I see. Then we have no choice but to say our farewells here. Taiman said sadly. Why would it be a farewell, it's only a goodbye, and I'm not returning today. Really. All of them got happy that he would stay at least another day. Asafa we can't stay too long. Nala said. I understand. He nodded that night, the gang returned to their sleeping quarters, all in different moods. Nala and Ayana were excited. Taiman and Pumba were the saddest, while Imani felt like it wouldn't be long before they met again. Hamu was thinking that all this was a prank to test his intelligence. Asafa had a hard time sleeping, so he carefully stood up and silently left the yard to get some alone time. He walked to the opening where his father had shown himself previously. Asafa looked up to the sky in wonder. You are my son huh? Asafa spoke the word his father had repeatedly told him, he felt like his father meant something more with those words. No, my dad is a baboon. A weird voice said from beside Asafa, making him jump slightly as he hadn't noticed the monkey beside him. I must have been in very deep thought to not notice him as this. What was his name, Ratsitsiki? Asafa wondered as he looked at the monkey that was staring at the sky while sitting beside him. 
Asafa doesn't remember every detail of this world, since it had been a lifetime since he last saw the Lion King in his former life, but he knew that this monkey was a friend of his father. Who are him? Who are you? Asafa asked. Not your son, are you my son? The Moki asked while tilting his head while looking at him. No, Asafa's eye twitched. What's your name? Asafa then tried asking him again. My name is Rafiki started looking around as if he was afraid someone else was going to hear him, then he waved Asafa to come closer, as if what he was about to say was a great secret. Asafa came closer. The question is, who are you? Rafiki whispered. TSK monkey are you trying to get eaten? Asafa asked in irritation as he felt slightly tricked. Has this monkey eaten some bad shrooms or something? My name is Asafa. The monkey claimed before standing upright and shouting, and Mufasa is my father. TSK monkey stop playing around, I'm Asafa, son of Mufasa. Asafa said while scratching his ear that hurt by the shouting of the monkey. Getting a baboon to talk straight was harder and more annoying than he would have thought. Rafiki said surprised by what Asafa said. I thought you were he then hugged Asafa closer and whispered come here it's a secret. When they were closer Rafiki said a sand sauna squashed banana on it nana lala lala. As he started jumping around in excitement. You crazy monkey I'm about to eat you. Ha 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 not a good idea to eat your son. The monkey claimed. TSK who is my son you monkey. Asafa retorted, the only reason he didn't leave is because he knew that this crazy baboon was his father's friend. Who is your son? You don't know. Mufasa is your son. Rafiki suddenly stopped and said very seriously. Mufasa isn't my son he's my father. Asafa said as he got tired of the monkey. But what if Mufasa was your son the monkey said slowly as if he was about to reveal something groundbreaking. Would you hate him if he got into trouble and you had to save him, even at the cost of your life? Rafiki asked with a serious tone, as he for the first time so far looked straight into Asafa's eyes. Of course not, it's my responsibility as his father to protect him even if I die. If was my son suddenly Asafa's eyes widened as he realized something. Asafa at this point realized what his father was telling him, whatever you feel guilty about, it does not matter, you are my son, and dying to protect you is my responsibility, and I will never hold that against you. You are my son. That's what his father was telling him. His father understood that Asafa felt guilty about his death, but it did not matter, even if he truly was the root cause of his death, a father would never blame his son. I'm his son Asafa whispered, but he had fallen deep into contemplation and seemed slightly out of it. Rafiki smiled and looked at the sky. So this is the gift you left for Rafiki. A good gift indeed old friend. Rafiki shouted at the sky with a wide grin. Asafa didn't even notice that Rafiki was shouting at the sky. Chuckle indeed I'm Asafa, son of Mufasa Asafa said with conviction, no longer holding any feeling of responsibility for his father's death. If I died protecting Simba, I would never feel that it was his fault, no matter how dumb Simba was behaving. That's because he is my brother. At the same time, father would never feel that I'm at fault because I'm his son Asafa thought with a smile. As he stood up he noticed the monkey sitting down in meditation. Monkey, thank you. Asafa said, realizing that the baboon wasn't really as crazy as he seemed. My name is Rafiki, a friend of your father. Rafiki said while his eyes were closed. I figured. So what will you do now, my king? Rafiki said while opening one of his eyes first I need to take back what belongs to me, Asafa said with conviction. Rafiki nodded. Then I'll ban all crazy baboons from stepping into the pride lands. Asafa said as he turned around, getting ready to leave. Swish Asafa heard the sound of a swing, and he dodged the staff Rafiki had swung at him from behind. Oh good, good reflexes. Rafiki said quite impressed. Asafa simply smiled at him as he continued leaving. Asafa had been gone for a long while, and when he returned he found all of his gang discussing something. It seemed like they couldn't sleep as well. I see, so his uncle is an evil king. Humba said. Finally you get it. Ayana said with an eye roll. But how can I be his uncle if I'm a snake? Hamu seemed even more confused. How did you arrive at the conclusion that you're his uncle Ayana almost lost it when she heard this? You said that his uncle is king, I'm the king of this forest, so I'm his his uncle. Hamu used his super logic. Nala and Ayana stared at his with their mouths slightly agape. Yay that makes perfect sense. 
Imani confirmed Hamu's hypothesis with a paw on her chin as he pondered his words deeply. No, no, no. His uncle has a scar. Pumba said. No, listen up. Asafa's uncle, a lion became an evil king of the Pride Lands. Now we need Asafa to return to save the Pride Lands. Nala said as she felt that her sister would soon go on a killing spree. Ooh, why didn't you say that? Taiman said as he realized. We did times two wait, so let me get this straight, Asafa is really a king, Imani asked as she came to realization. Yes. Nala was also slowly losing it. Imani's eyes widened she suddenly hugged Taiman, Pumba and Hamu together, and whispered something to them. I think we should follow Asafa and defeat the evil king with a scar. She whispered to the team. Are you crazy? Didn't you hear her? It's a fight between lions and hyenas, both of which wants to eat us. Taiman disagreed besides, they have help from their uncle that can defeat the evil king. Hamu gave his two cents, no no hold up guys, look, if Asafa becomes king. Just imagine the royal life we'll have. Imani explained her reasoning wait, I just got an idea. If Asafa becomes king, and we're his closest friends, imagine how luxuriously we'll live with many lions that'll protect us. Taiman came up with a brilliant idea. All of them suddenly fell into contemplation. The lifestyle here in the forest was good, but a royal lifestyle. That's even better. Ahem, I think, as Asafa's closest friends, we should be selfless and help him out when he's in need. Hamu said loudly and bravely. Agreed. Imani said. Agreed. Taiman said. Agreed. Pumba said. Nala and Aana looked at each other and felt that something was off, they couldn't hear what the crew whispered about, but their gut feeling told them that these guys were just behaving shamelessly right now. It would mean a lot to me if you followed. Asafa said as he heard their last statement as he arrived here. They all turned to him. I didn't want to ask you to leave your lives here for me, but it means everything to me that you're willing to follow me. Asafa said with a smile. Your Highness. The crew bowed down to show their loyalty. We don't do that here. Asafa said while waving his paw. Hamu also bowed that's when he realized something of importance, how could he, a super snake, king of the forest bow to others? At worst, he was equal to Asafa, and at best, he was a super king and was superior to Asafa's normal kingship. HMPH you tricked me. Hamu said in a huff. Asafa ignored him and started walking to the sleeping area as he had gotten sleepy. He needed rest as tomorrow they would start their travels. Ah don't ignore me, tell me the truth, you want to get my defenses down, so you can usurp my throne. Hamu said while pointing his tail at Asafa, but he noticed that everyone ignored him and started walking to their sleeping area. How is he not after my crown? No I won't be tricked by you guys. He shouted and tried to catch up to them unwillingly, after all, the best place to sleep is in the soft and cozy mane of Asafa, and if Taiman got there first, he might take his favorite spot. Vile creatures, you tricked me so you could take my spot, Hamu cried as he he caught up then, but they had all already gotten to their sleeping positions. They slept well and after they awoke they ate and drank their fill, and then started their journey back. If Afasa ran alone he could get back to the Pride Lands in half a week, but since they were traveling in a group, it would take them at least a week, maybe even more. As they were traveling Asafa seemed lost in thought, this didn't go unnoticed by Nala or Aana. They understood that this was a great moment in Asafa's life. He would return to his birthplace and home, fight his uncle for the position of king. But they were unaware of the fact that Asafa was thinking about how he should expose the fact that Scar killed his own brother. Asafa had so far avoided telling Nala and Aana that Scar killed Mufasa, he had only told them that he and Simba escaped, while falsely believing that they were guilty for their father's death, but he never told them that Scar directly killed Mufasa. After a week, they finally reached the Pride Lands, and in the horizon they could see the Pride Rock. So that's your home, the place your king. Diamond said as he looked around. The whole place seemed so dead and gray. My kingdom is prettier. Hamu said. This place seems so blue. Pumba said, Pumba water is blue, not this place. It's gray at best. Taiman corrected. But I meant. Pumba tried explaining, but he got cut off. No buts. You have enough of that already. Oh I see. Pumba said. Which way should we take? Imani asked as she looked around. Everyone turned to Asafa, but his sight was on another place. That way. Asafa said as he looked at the Great Rift, where his father had died. 
that's a long way, it's better if go right. Nala advised. It doesn't matter, there's something I want to see there. He said, not explaining. They all nodded then followed him. Soon, they arrived at the beginning of the rift, that's when Asafa slowed down and started walking with heavy steps. It wasn't until they reached a third way into the rift that they stopped by a big rock that was in the middle of their path. Asafa walked closer to it and just stared at it, reminiscing about that day. Asafa are you okay? Ayana asked. What's going on kiddo? Taiman also asked as they noticed his somber mood. It was a sunny day when my uncle Scar brought me and Simba here. Asafa said. Everyone perked up at this, especially Nala and Ayana as they weren't familiar with this story. He told us to wait here, because our father had a big surprise for us, one to die for. Asafa said. The crew listened on waiting for the rest of the story, but Nala caught onto some hints by his words, and started frowning while getting bad feeling about this. Me and my brother competed in our roaring while waiting for our father right here. Asafa said as he chuckled at the memory of his brother, while walking up to he big rock. That's when the ground started shaking, and the rift started to fill up with wildebeests running for their life, it felt like there was a million of them. Asafa then started walking in the direction he and his brother ran. The crew followed while Nala and Ayana looked at each other in shock. Scar had told a similar story, but he never told them that he was the one that brought Simba and Asafa here. They realized that something was wrong, very wrong. As they continued walking down, Pumba asked the man what happened then. Not understanding that the story Asafa was telling was the death of Mufasa. We ran for our lives, but our small eggs could only take us so far before the wildebeests caught up to us. He said while pointing further down the rift at another rock with a broken, dead tree beside it. We reached that place and climbed up. Asafa said. Soon they reached the half-broken, dead tree. Our father then ran down into the heart of wildebeests to save us, he picked up Simba while I climbed his back. Asafa said with a bitter smile. They continued walking, but both Nala and Ayana looked bloodthirsty at this point, they realized that Scar had lied about the story, and that it was his fault that the accident had happened. But they weren't yet aware that it wasn't an unintentional accident. Soon they stopped as Asafa looked up the side of the rift, the cliff. See those marks. My father climbed up there and left us on that rock right there. He said while pointing at a specific rock. They all looked up at the marks made from Mufasa's claws, and the rock where Simba and Asafa had been dropped off, they looked like they could see the scenes in their minds. Father continued climbing up as he couldn't fit on the rock. Simba tried to climb up as well, but I stayed as my eyes couldn't leave father. Asafa said. At this point the crew understood that this story was the story of that day, the day Asafa's father died. They all listened closely. When he reached the top, a pair of claws gripped his claws, holding tight, I'd recognize those claws any day, anywhere. Asafa said. Scar. Nala said in understanding, and Asafa nodded in confirmation. But if Scar was there, how did Mufasa die? Ayana asked what everyone was wondering now. They'd never guessed that Scar would kill his own brother. Indeed, my uncle was there, holding into my father, but he was also the one to push off my father, right down to the horde of wildebeests. Asafa dropped a bomb on them. Everyone's eyes widened, aghast at what they had just heard. Nala and Ayana was the most shocked at this as they grew up hearing a whole another story. That Scar had found Asafa and Simba being mischievous again running towards the horde of wildebeests and getting themselves into trouble, so he hurried to get the king to save them. That's when they accidentally got Mufasa killed, and then they also died in that horde. Now it made sense how Simba and Asafa had lived through this day, Scar lied. When they came back to their senses, they realized that Asafa had walked further down. So they hurried to him still shaken by what they had heard. And right here, I found him laying without a breath. Asafa said as he stood where his father died. Yes, his goal was with visiting this place was to explain what had happened on that day. Both Ayana and Nala came up to him and rubbed their heads against him to show empathy. The crew also came up to him and showed care. Asafa, Scar is an usurper, a corrupt king and a traitor, you need to punish him. Ayana said lastly with a dangerous flint in her eyes. Nala had a very dangerous glint eye her eye. But it couldn't compare to the one in Ayana's eye. It was as if she had her eyes set on prey. Nala did have better self-control. She had to have that in order to take care of her younger sister, and the younger one never controlled herself. She went wild, and that's the difference between the two. 
Asafa saw their eyes and understood that an execution had to happen, unlike how it would have gone if his brother had returned instead. Asafa saw that everyone had the right mentality and seemed ready to ride or die, so he didn't waste any time, and took a small path from the end of the rift that led right to the side of the Pride Rocks. Simba had shown him this path to the rift that day when Scar had called them there. It hid them well and was secretive, and it wasn't until they had reached very close to the Pride Rock that their plan was set in motion. Pumbaa jumped up with Taiman and Hamu on his back, making a ruckus, then running away when they gained the attention of the hyena. When Asafa saw that they succeeded in working as bait to lure away the guarding hyenas, he nodded to Amani, giving her the signal that it was her turn. She nodded back and started chasing Pumba from a distance to protect them. Only then did Nala and Ayana start to climb the Pride Rock. Their mission was to first assemble the lionesses, and then Asafa would come up a minute after them. Asafa saw them climb up and waited, only when he heard the angry roar of Scar echo down, which made his blood boil, did he stand up, ready to climb. Just as he was about to climb up, two hyenas walked down the cliff. Ha 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 Scar is angry again, it's better to escape before he releases it on us instead. Ha ha you're right, huh? Where is everyone? The other hyena asked, as they found the foot of the pride rock empty. Maybe they took a leak. All of them? The other questioned. Right at that moment, a big brown flash passed them by, pushing down one of them to the ground by his neck, and biting the other in the neck. Asafa bit through the hyena's neck and felt a crunch, then the hyena went limp. So he reached for the other and bit him as well, but he noticed at that point that the other had also died when he pushed his neck slightly too hard, breaking it. Asafa turned around and started to climb, and when he was almost up, he heard their discussions. Yes we found the hyena killer. Nala said with an eerily cold tone. Ayana was keeping silent as she didn't have the self-control to not reveal everything. And did you kill him? Scar said dangerously Sarabi and the other lionesses were looking at the two in worry. Scar was having an especially bad day today. No, we couldn't. Nala said. And why exactly is that? Scar said in a growl as he walked closer to Nala. Because I am him. A heavy voice filed the assembly. Everyone turned towards the path down, and soon found a gigantic brown lion with even darker brown mane walk up. All of their eyes widened in slight worry, as they had never seen such a huge lion before. But the weird thing was, that everyone felt that he was very familiar. Sarabi would have shouted her husband's name because of the similarities between the two, had it not been for the size and color difference. Even Scar took a step back as his eyes widened. Brother. Was his first thought. Their voices were too similar. Who are you? Sarabi suddenly asked. He's the hope we found. Ayana turned to everyone and said. How dare you come into my kingdom? Scar suddenly felt enraged and roared at Asafa. Your kingdom? Or Mufasa's? Asafa shouted back, his shout was so powerful that they almost felt the ground shake, and everyone took a step back. Even Scar stopped in his tracks. Mufasa is dead, this is mine. Scar said, he was getting ready to give the order for everyone to attack this intruder. Dead, and you killed him. Asafa said, making everyone snap their heads to Scar, barely following the words. How dare you make such a claim, everyone, kill him. Scar said in a cold voice, but to his surprise, Sarabi had stopped everyone from moving. Young man, why would you lay such a claim on our king's head? Sarabi asked Asafa, without knowing that it was her own son she was speaking to. Because I was there that day and saw him kill my father. He said, slowly letting his words sink in, and everyone, one for one, started to realize the nature of his words. Scar was the first one to lose his calm. Simba know that's Asafa. He realized. Mother I'm back. Asafa said in a soft voice. Sarabi's eyes widened as she didn't dare to believe it at first. She rushed to him and rubbed her head with his. Asafa how are you alive? She cried. Asafa rubbed her head back, before taking a step closer to Nala and Ayana to explain to everyone. That day was planned by my uncle, his plan to usurp his brother and kill the princes. Asafa said to everyone. Lies, it's impossible. I saw my nephews die who are you? Scar got nervous and tried to make everyone suspicious of Asafa, even though he realized that Asafa was really alive. That day you sent the hyenas after me and my brother, but they didn't do their work properly, Asafa said. His words seemed to clear up Scar's own suspicions. Why didn't you return? Sarabi questioned. 
because I knew our uncle would kill us even if I returned, so I had to bid my time so I could grow. He said. That's not true, nothing would make me happier than if my nephews returned alive and well. Scar said with a relieved tone. He realized that everyone believed in Asafa's identity, with only a few looking skeptical still. It doesn't matter, now that he's here, he's the rightful king. Ayana shouted. You disgusting little. Scar got angry and was about to slap her, but before he could, Asafa arrived near her and slapped Scar so hard he fell three meters back. Everyone was absolutely shocked at Asafa's speed and power. Scar slowly stood up feeling dizzy. That's when everyone saw it, he had another scar on his other eye. Flap 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 a bluebird was flying towards the pride rock. Bad news, the hyenas are chasing a pig, a meerkat and a snake huh? The bird landed near Sarabi and shouted in panic, but he got confused as he looked around. What's going on here? He asked. Zazu, welcome back. A strong lion's voice was heard. Thank you Mr. Sir. Zazu said with manners until it clicked in his head. Who are you? He asked in surprise and worry. Looking at Asafa, he found him similar to Mufasa but browner. Wait don't tell me you're his Zazu said as his eyes jumped from Asafa to Scar and jumped between them a few times. Haha no Zazu, he's my uncle. Asafa laughed. His laughter was similar his father's which made Zazu relax in nostalgia. Zazu heaved a sigh of relief. Uncle, I see. That's good I couldn't handle another of him. Zazu whispered. But then he flew back two meters in surprise. Uncle Zazu shouted in askance yes, don't tell me you don't remember me Zazu. A Asafa, yes. Asafa confirmed with a smile. Zazu flew towards him like a cannon and hugged him. Young master. Is all he could say. He couldn't find his words. Everyone. I am Asafa son of Mufasa. Rightful king of the pride lands. Today I have returned to execute the traitor and usurper, Scar, anyone that sides with him will share his punishment. Asafa roared out. No one seemed to take Scar's side as they all walked behind Asafa and shows their allegiance. Asafa is violence all you know. Can't we handle this politely? Scar asked softly, but his tone got darker for every word. He took his time so he could wait for all the hyenas to gather, and they did, as they filled the pride rocks. Time for peace has ended, everyone, take care of the intruders. Asafa roared as he rushed towards his uncle. Scar turned around and left, dozens of hyenas taking his place and rushing towards Asafa. Asafa didn't waste time and rushed towards the hyenas. This action caused the other lionesses to worry, especially Sarabi, Nala and Ayana. But in a few seconds they were left aghast. Asafa rushed into the group of hyenas and attacked them. His striking speed was so fast that the hyenas couldn't dodge, and every slash he made left deadly injuries. Asafa slashed at the head of one of the hyenas, which opened up his head in four parts from Asafa's claws. The hyena fell dead instantly. Asafa didn't hold back and attacked them all with all he got, and it didn't take long until he killed all of them. The lionesses saw this and realized that Asafa could handle himself well and focused on the hyenas in front of them instead. Seeing the surrounding corpses, Asafa hurried after Scar. As he followed the path Scar had taken, that led to the backside of the Pride Rock, he finally caught up to Scar. Scar wasn't overly worried about his life. He knew that from this day on, he would have to escape and reassemble his army before taking over the Pride Rock once again, but he was sure he could do it. He wasn't worried about his nephew catching up since about 15 hyenas had attacked him, and it would take a long time for Asafa to handle them. By then he, Scar, would be long gone. What made Scar angry right now was that the hyenas were acting up, refusing to listen. Scar, you haven't held up your part of the deal, why should we offer our lives for you now? Some of the leaders asked. TSK, now is not the time for this, we need to escape so we can regroup our forces. By then we can take over this place fully. Scar said angrily. By then I see no point in you being king. You promised us riches and food, but there's nothing for us here. You imbecile, you want to give up the pride lands. Scar got angrier. Imbecile. Scar, it seems like you've forgotten that the only reason we joined you was because of benefits you promised us not because we loyally serve you. The hyena got angrier as well. Suddenly both their ears picked up the sound of paws running towards them at super speed. Scar, the hyena leader and a few underlings all turned back, and they could barely react before Asafa pounced the hyena leader, and killed him in one bite. 
The next thing Scar saw gave him the fright of his life. Asafa simply slapped one of the hyena's heads, and his head turned in a very unnatural way, and he fell down, dead. Asafa within three seconds killed all the hyenas. Asafa. This was all a misunderstanding. Scar tried with his kindest voice to calm down the beast in front of him. No Scar, there is no misunderstanding, stand properly, this is a death match. Asafa said in a growl. A death match between two family members. That couldn't be. You see this wasn't my plan at all Asafa, this was those disgusting dogs, they forced me to do this. This was all their plot, if I had a choice I would have killed them all. There's no point in blaming anyone else uncle. Asafa said as he jumped towards Scar. Scar stood on his hind legs and attacked Asafa as well. But to Asafa, he seemed way too slow. Asafa dodged every slash and attack Scar made. Asafa felt like an adult fighting a six-year-old, that was the difference between himself and Scar. Yet he also understood that Scar was not known for his physical prowess. After playing with Scar for a while, Asafa slashed Scar's jaw which made it rip off, Scar fell down and roared in pain. Asafa stood above him and looked down on Scar, the person that killed his father. You plot to kill my father, you plot to kill my brother, and you plot to kill me. This is the result of your evil ways Scar. Asafa said as he looked down on his uncle that couldn't speak because his jaw had been ripped off. Scar had fear all over his eyes as he tried crawling away. How did it feel to see your own brother fall down to his death? Asafa asked as he walked even closer to his uncle that tried to get away. To me it felt like the whole world fell apart. Asafa said. Scar looked at his nephew and tried to speak, but he couldn't. How ironic, you can't even beg for mercy. Asafa spoke his last words to Scar. Asafa raised his paw and slashed Scar's face with such power that his claws ripped right through his skull, making brain matter explode from his head. Scar laid there dead, looking like half his head had been blown off. Killing you. Truly didn't bring any inner peace to me, but at least it will bring peace to these lands. Asafa said as he took a last look at his dead uncle. Turning around he hurried back to where the battle was taking place, and when he arrived where the other lions were, he found them overwhelmed by the amount of hyenas. Asafa hurried into battle and started killing more hyenas, he was like a tank on turbo that couldn't be stopped. He himself turned the tides and made it easier for the lions to fight back. In the end when the hyenas were down to their last twenty, they stopped fighting. It was at that point that the lionesses stood behind Asafa waiting for his decision on what would happen. Asafa looked at his pride and saw some of them hurt, and all of them seemed tired. Asafa took in a long breath before roaring with all his might, the roar shocked the very rock they stood on, and was heard from the pride rocks to the horizon. The hyenas fell down holding their ears in pain. After the roar Asafa looked at the hyenas and waited for them to gather themselves. Scar has been killed for his traitorous acts, you have been punished as well. If you want to keep fighting, I won't spare you, but if you escape from this lands and never turn back, I'll spare you today. Asafa said with finality in his voice. The hyenas looked at each other, there was no fighting will left, so they nodded at each other, coming to terms with how the battle had ended. Thank you for your mercy. A bigger hyena said bitterly before turning away and escaping, followed by the other hyenas. Today had been a great loss to the hyenas and the lions alike. Asafa turned to look at his family, and it was at this moment that the cloudy sky finally let down its rain to quench the thirst of the ground. Asafa. Sarabi cried out finally when things had calmed down as she hurried to put her head against her sons. Mother, I'm finally back. He whispered. The rain got heavy as it started pouring, it was impossible to know whether tears fell at that moment. It is time for the king to return. A joyful voice cried out. Asafa looked up and found Rafiki sitting on a rock looking down at them with a gigantic smile. Rafiki. Asafa smiled, and so did the other lionesses as they recognized the advisor of the former king. He hadn't shown his face in these lands since Mufasa died. Some of the younger lions didn't know who he was, but didn't act rudely because how their elders were being respectful. Rafiki climbed down and hugged Asafa as well, your majesty. Suddenly Taiman, Pumba and Imani said as they came up to him in smiles. Hamu was also smiling, but he didn't call Asafa as king. Asafa saw that Hamu was relieved that everyone was fine. Nala and Ayano also came up to him and showed their affection. 
Off cough Rafiki fake coughed to gain their attention, and when he got it, he looked towards the peak of the Pride Rock, where the Lion King would show his kingship. Asafa nodded and started walking up there in the rain, his long mane was wet because of the rain, and he slowly walked up. Asafa couldn't help but to feel nostalgic as the last time he was here was with his father, and at that time, everything seemed so easy but at this moment as he walked up, he felt heavy as he understood the responsibility that would befall him. When he reached the peak of the rock he looked over the pride lands, all of it would fall under his protection. Looking back at the others he saw hope, joy and relief in their eyes. Asafa looked forward and once again roared with all his might. A mighty roar that reached the ends of the pride lands. Which was soon joined by the roars of the other lionesses as well. Soon, every animal in the pride lands knew that a new king had been chosen, and a new cycle had started for the circle of life. Soon everyone saw the dark clouds in the sky turn into a lion's face that was smiling down on the pride lands. Mufasa. Sarabi was the first to react when she saw the smiling face in the sky, but the face only lasted for a few seconds before turning into clouds once again, but this time with the rays of the sun going through them and shining on the pride lands. For a second, Sarabi thought that she was imagining it until she saw how everyone else also seemed to have the same look of recognition. Sarabi then smiled as she understood that the former kings have accepted Asafa as the rightful ruler. So what will you do now your majesty? Zazu flew to Asafa and bowed. I'll first make a new law that everyone have to bow down to me when they see me. Amu said as he puffed up his chest. Wham Rafiki hit the snake on his head. We'll go through some hardship for a while, it'll be hard to eat until the grass has grown and attracted more life here. Asafa said while thinking about the future. Zazu smiled as he felt pride, seeing how the cub had grown into such fine lion. Yes indeed, hardship is on the horizon. He said it as if there was no problem at all, in fact, it seemed like all his problems had disappeared. Asafa chuckled when he heard Zazu say it like that, he picked up the bird and hugged him. Why your majesty, this is highly improper Zazu panicked. Asafa laughed at the bird, and the others laughed as well. But our king I have one question. A lioness walked forward looking confused. Yes. Zazu jumped out of Asafa's embrace and answered for him. Did you bring us food? When can we eat him? She asked innocently as she pointed at Pumba. Aaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaaa
Asafa asked while rubbing head with Ayana, who seemed to care less than even Asafa. Not yet my king, but I heard from my network that they are about to. Zazu said. I see let's go take care of it then. Asafa said as he stood up. A few of the hunter females also stood up. This fight was usually between males, but since there were no other males in this pride as Scar had chased them off, the females had to come as backup. Zazu was very worried about this fact, and so was the other lionesses. Zazu flew on top of Asafa's head and whispered to him. My king, there are about six strong lions that have come, what should we do? Zazu didn't want to worry the other, but right now, their pride was weak. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Asafa said as he started running, with Nala, Ayana and six other lionesses following. Gulps Azu worried still, this was the first great challenge that Asafa had to overcome as the new Lion King. Taiman, Pumba and Hamu were relaxing at the foot of the Pride Rock, enjoying a joyful morning. Every now and then a lion would pass them, at that point Hamu and Taiman would call for the lioness and show off Pumba with a knowing smile. They knew that the lions couldn't kill them, so to see an apex predator see a juicy pig like Pumba, but not being able to eat him, it made their whole day. So they did this every time, they stopped a passing lion and showed off Pumba. Oh look Timon, a group of lions are coming down, let's see how many of them turn sour when we show off Pumba. Hamu said Pumba puffed up in pride. Hey lions, look at Pumba, he is the tastiest huh? Asafa. Where are you going? Taiman asked as he noticed that Asafa was leading the group. Asafa ran past them with a frown on his face, he didn't even notice them. Sigh, the kid has grown, to even ignore us like that. Pumba said with a sigh. What kind of lion passes you Pumba, without giving you a second look? His arrogance is through the roof. Hamu go the most offended. He felt like lions had to stop and give Pumba a second look. Pumba looked sad when he heard that, he stood up and tried to look at his bum. Did it become smaller? He asked with a sad tone. Pumba, don't worry about it, this is natural at our age. Lions are just more interested in younger, fatter pigs nowadays. Timon said in a sad tone. Ah, I see. No no look here. Hamu said angrily. Smack smack he smacked Pumba's butt twice. Bounce bounce see, Pumba still got it, the wrong is not on our side, Asafa has changed since he became king. I think we should teach him a lesson usurp him and make me king instead. Hamu said angrily. His sense of justice wouldn't let him keep silent when he saw this kind of behavior. Hum time and put his hand under his chin as he thought about it. Let's go complain to his mother about this. Time and said as he came up with a brilliant plan. Yes, maybe she'll make me king. Hamu agreed. As for Asafa he hurried to his borders according to the directions of Zazu. When he arrived he stopped and looked around. It seems like they haven't arrived yet my king. Zazu said in relief. No, Zazu, they have. Asafa said in a frown as he could smell the distinct smell of other male lions. How where? Zazu got frightened, and the female lions behind got ready for a fight. Stop hiding and show yourselves. Asafa said in a bored tone. Soon from the tall grass, six lions stood up looking at them with a predator's gaze. All the lions had manes, three of them had thin manes, as if they had just recently become adults. Two other lions looked bigger and more mature. But their leader was the biggest and strongest lion. His mane was yellowish while his fur was vanilla white. He looked the most mature and seemed to be in his prime. This is the pride lands, you should know what it means to cross my borders. Asafa said in a warning tone. Indeed we knoweth why did you bring your women. The leader spoke up, slightly offended that the women had been brought into this. It wasn't that he considered them not a threat, female lions were excellent hunters, and most definitely a threat, especially in groups. Rather, it was looked down upon in the lion world to bring the women to fight, because when males fought for territory, they also fought for the right to the women, so they could have more children. But if the women also fought, there was a chance that they would get harmed, and then they would risk the chances to have children, which was the biggest reason for the fight from the start. So it was heavily looked down upon. The world of lions is harsh. They have to fight to have children and they have to fight for territory. All the lions understood this. This was why it wasn't just male lions that would get nervous whenever other lions came into their territory, the female would also get nervous, as they would be the final prize for the winners. And if the opposing lions won, they would kill all the cubs and mutilate the unborn children in the stomach of the pregnant female, and then the female would belong to the new king. 
Asafa didn't answer as he knew that today, a serious fight would break out. Do not think badly of us, we act only out of necessity, their leader said to Asafa, swing how Asafa seemed young. Kill him. The leader commanded his lions. You guys take on one of them, I'll handle the rest. Asafa said, gaining the surprised looks of both his pride and the enemies. Don't worry, I can take care of them. Asafa said as he saw the worry on the lioness's eyes. But they had gotten their command, they would hold back one of the lions, and Asafa would take care of the others. They still couldn't help but to worry, since if Asafa fell here today, they would fall under a new king. They knew how strong Asafa was against hyenas, but they didn't actually see his real fight against Scar, so they didn't know how much stronger he was than the average lion. Pompous and conceited. The enemy leader spat out as he heard Asafa's command, feeling that the lion was young and inexperienced. The lion leader stood back and looked as the lionesses attacked one, while the other four circled around Asafa. Before they could attack him, he attacked them to their surprise. They thought he would be on the defensive since they had the number advantage. Asafa jumped forward while slashing one of the lions, making him fall to the ground. Then he turned around and slashed another one that attacked from behind, his claws cut through the mane, and made the male lion bleed from the neck. The other two lions attacked at the same time from the side, Asafa was faster and a bit one of them through the mane, and pushed the other away. The one he had between his jaws, struggled but couldn't break free. The enemy leader saw all this and felt his heart pound, he had never before seen a lion with his speed, strength and reflexes. He instantly understood that they would all die if they continued fighting. He was experienced and understood all this. Fall back. The leader shouted, and all his underling hurriedly fell back behind their leader. The one that fought the lionesses wasn't harmed, only a few small slashes. But the first lion that got attacked by Asafa, had a deep slash mark on his face, and laid where he had been slashed from the beginning. Another one that stood behind his leader was bleeding from his mane, as Asafa cut through his mane with his claws. Seeing this, the leader got even more nervous. The lion's greatest shield is his mane, it's almost impossible to cut through and make a lion bleed from his mane area. And the fact that Asafa had done just that showed his strength. And then there was another one that was struggling while being held in Asafa's mouth. Asafa was holding one of the young male lions in his mouth, while giving the enemy leader his predatory look. We surrender. The lion leader said. Asafa let go of the lion that he held between his teeth, and the lion hurried to his leader with his tail between his legs. Asafa saw that the leader wanted to leave, but he wouldn't let him do that so easily. Asafa stepped on one of the lions that was still laying on the ground, while bleeding from the gash that Asafa had given him. Asafa pressed his paw on the lion's head, and his head exploded. Do you think that it's that easy to step into my territory and claim my women? Asafa asked with anger lingering in his tone. The leader understood that they'd have to pay a heavy prize today to leave with their lives intact. As for the lionesses, they were looking at Asafa with newfound attraction. The lion that could protect his pride with prowess is what would make any lioness look up to him. We have three young females that have not yet bore any children, the lion leader said with a heavy tone. Asafa looked at him in the eyes, and after a minute of thinking he nodded, understanding that the enemy leader was offering three female lions to give him. You have until the sun reached that point to bring them here, otherwise we'll follow you and make sure to take over your whole territory. Asafa said while pointing at the sky. The leader nodded and hurried off with the remaining lions. Today he had paid a heavy prize for his loss. He lost one young male lion and three female lions. When the male lions had disappeared far away, the lionesses all pounced their king in pure bliss. Why you were like pow. Ayana cried out in surprise. And then Wam as you slapped him. Another one said. Then Weish as you slashed him another lioness said. Since when were you this strong? Nala asked with skepticism, she had never heard of a lion this strong before. The FFTS, Nala please, since when were I not this strong? Asafa said, turning the question on her. She was about to argue, but remembered back, she realized that they had never won against him in any physical fight. They all looked at him like they were looking at gold. For female lions, their point of attraction is a strong male that can protect them and their offspring. That's why a big lion might be attractive as that is a sign of someone strong, or an arrogant one L, as the arrogant ones are usually like that because they have not tastes lost before. As for male lions, they are attracted to female that can carry many children. 
Asafa looked at the women and realized that he had lots of hard work to do when they got back. One male lion arrived at where the fight took place, and he brought three young but adult females that seemed slightly worried. The male lion nodded at Asafa in worry and hurried back after leaving the lionesses there. My king, we are under you, ah I mean, we will follow you from now on. One of the female lions said. She has pale, almost white, rather, vanilla white fur and yellow eyes. Asafa found her pretty, but she seemed shy. The others were yellow and had green eyes. From now on, you belong to the pride lands. Asafa said as he turned around and started walking back, the three followed after him, and then the other lionesses followed. The truth was, he found it awkward so he used less words. But there was one thing that struck Asafa, he found a slight similarity between the white lioness and the leader of the lions that attack. Is your father the leader that attacked us? Asafa asked her as he walked. Gulp why yes, my father's name is Tukufu. She said as she lowered her head in worry. She was worried that he might kill her for the actions of her father. I see, well. You don't have to worry, I take good care of those that I have promised to protect. Asafa said, trying to relieve her from her worries. He couldn't understand why the lion leader had sent him his daughter. In the end, when they arrived at Pride Rocks, they were welcomed by all the lionesses that were worried for the outcome. Ayana was the first one that rushed into the others, so she could tell what happened. And the three new lions were about to walk inside then Pride Rock Den, but Asafa stopped the daughter of the leader that attacked. The others can go in, I need to speak with her. Asafa said as he saw how Sarabi welcomed the new lionesses. The other walked into their cave while the white lion held her head down. What's your name? Asafa asked. Zahara. She whispered. If it wasn't for Asafa's supreme hearing he wouldn't catch that. Why did your father send you here? Is he plotting something? He asked. She jumped up at that. And no. I heard from the lions what had happened. To make sure that the rest survived he offered the only females that hadn't been pregnant yet, but there was only three, me included she explained, worried that another war between territories might start. So that's how it is you don't have to worry about anything. This is your home from now on Zahara. Asafa said, trying to sound welcoming. You rascal. You brought more women home. Come here and let me beat you up. Suddenly the voice of the panther cried out. Asafa's face dropped. TSK, she's pretty as well. Shame on you Asafa. Imani said as she came up to Zahara and inspected her. Zahara was totally confused, what was a black panther doing here? And being so disrespectful to the mighty king of pride lands. Imani not now Asafa said in a tone that asked her to go away. When then? When she's already pregnant with five cubs. You shamelessly horny little thing, let me teach you some manners. Imani got even angrier, ready to fight. Zahara hid her face beneath her paws when she heard those shameful words. Ah wait. Sorry Asafa, she got angry when you disappeared again, hold her time and. Pumba cried out as he hurried to Imani and held her back. Sigh trouble follows wherever you go. Asafa whispered to himself. Zahara, let's go inside and meet everyone. Asafa said as he walked inside the cave. Zahara simply nodded while still hiding her face bashfully. Don't you dare escape from me. I'm not done with you until I teach you to not conquer women like that. Imani shouted while Pumba, Taiman and Hamu held her back. Life continued on for Asafa as seasons changed, he worked hard to make sure his land become fruitful again, and stories of his strength and bravery reached far and wide. Amongst his pride, all the females, even the older ones looked at him like a piece of meat, which worried Asafa dearly. As for the three women that had recently joined, they were warmly welcomed, and it didn't take long for them to settle in. Zazu always gave a knowing smirk to Asafa, whenever the ladies kept surrounding him like flies, which started to annoy Asafa, and life continued as usual. Far, far away, a yellow lion with a light brown mane and a scar above his left eye, was looking at the other lions in front of him. He looked back at his tail, or at least what was left of it as he had lost most of it. My king have you remembered your past? Another lion asked. My name is the lion with a scar and without a tail said while frowning, deep in thought. My name is Simba. He said as he finally remembered his name. His memories had started coming back to him slowly, and now he finally remembered. Simba stood up and looked far into the horizon at a volcanic mountain, finally remembering what had happened that day. My king. Another lion asked. 
Simba had walked a lonely path without his memories, until he met other outcast lions. A fraud and Simba won over them until they were enough lions to call it a pride. In his new pride, there were four young males and two older ones. In addition to that there were three older female ones and three cubs. All of them had found shelter under Simba's protection, as all of them were outcasts, unwanted. They barely escaped death in their prides before escaping and finally finding each other. There were many fights about the leadership position, but Simba but won them all. And they were happy with that since he was a fair and strong leader. Now that his memories had returned, his sight couldn't leave the direction which he believed his family was at, Taiman, Pumba, Hamu, Imani and Asafa my king. Another lion asked as he saw tears fall down Simba's eyes. Simba kept silent, while thinking deeply about what he should do. His sight turned to his new pride, those he was protecting, looking at all of them he felt like he was stuck. He wanted to return to his brother and family, and life of no responsibilities, but he couldn't. He had become the one thing he tried escaping. I need some alone time. Simba said as he turned around and left to think. The lions looked at each other, not understanding why their leader had become like this. Maybe his memories revealed a painful past. A lion asked. Simba arrived at a small three and he jumped atop of it and laid down. His mind is telling him that he is no longer the Simba that he used to be with his family and brother, but now he was a leader and king. He has responsibilities right now that he had to fulfill. But his heart is telling him that he wants to return to the forest to Hakuna Matata. Simba had fallen into deep waters and felt stuck between a rock and a hard place. Simba had asked his pride for advice, and he told them the honest truth about everything. His pride got worried, because to them, he is their roots. He is their protector and provider. Without him life would become even harder. Seeing their worries he explained that he wouldn't leave them, but he also confessed that his heart longed for his brother and family. So they had long discussions about what they should do. Six months later, on top of a cliff that overlooked the Pride Lands, stood the current Lion King, Asafa. He looked down on all the animals that had gathered in front of the Pride Rock, today was a special day that required all of their attendance. A bird landed in front of the mighty Lion King and bowed. Asafa just smiled at him. All animals looked at Asafa, he was a great lion and even greater king. During his reign, the animals had food to eat, and water to drink. The borders were protected from other predators. They all hoped that the next Lion King, would also respect the circle of life. Soon Rafiki walked up on top of the cliff, called Pride Rock, and bowed beside the bird. Asafa smiled brightly as he looked at the two that had once stood beside his father. Rafiki, let's start the ceremony. Asafa spoke. Even though he sounded wise and calm, Rafiki saw through Asafa's calmness and saw excitement for this very day. Yes my king. They walked back to the lionesses of the pride, Rafiki found Nala, Ayana and Zahara, all with cubs in their arms. Nala had two, Ayana had three, and Zahara had two. Yes, during the last six months, the lionesses had become pregnant with cubs, and they had recently been born as female lions are only pregnant for five months. And today was the day that a prince would be crowned and crown prince. Your majesty Rafiki sees that you're a hard worker. Rafiki said with a grin. Asafa looked away, pretending to not hear. Which one is the crown prince, your majesty? Rafiki asked, he hadn't known about this, since this was his first time meeting the newborns. He would rarely involve himself in these matters except for such events. Rafiki, what was the name of my grandfather? Asafa asked as Ayana pushed forward the firstborn son of Asafa. Mahadu, my king. Rafiki answered while looking at the cub that looked exactly like a child version of Mufasa, only he had pale fur like Ayana, but a dark mane like his father. Rafiki opened up a fruit and used its juices to mark the crown prince on his forehead. The others? Rafiki asked. Kiara and Simba Asafa said introducing Nala's children. Nala was the first confirmed to be pregnant, they believed she would give the firstborns, yet Ayana beat her to it by one day. In addition to Mahadu, Mufasa and Amamu. Asafa told the names of Ayana's offspring, she only had sons. Zawadi and Tukufu. Asafa introduced his children with Zahara. Zawadi was his second daughter, while Tukufu got the name of Zahara's father, the lion leader who attacked their land. Rafiki looked at all of them, trying to understand all their different personalities. Both Kiara and Simba seemed the most energetic, and wanted to crawl out of their mother's arms. Most fitting names. Rafiki laughed. 
Then Rafiki turned towards Asafa and patted his back. Rafiki recognizes Mufasa and Mahadu. Rafiki said as he looked at the cub in his arms. Asafa couldn't help but to smile brightly as his son looked like his father. Asafa and Rafiki walked to the Pride Rocks cliff. They stood there as the ceremony started. Beneath the cliff, all the representatives and elders of different animal kin had gathered to see the next king. Rafiki held up Mahadu and all the animals then bowed down. Asafa and the other lionesses were smiling, but even then, Asafa couldn't help but to feel that there was something lacking. He had always believed that such moments would be shared with his long-dead brother, so right now, it felt slightly empty. Asafa didn't mind it all too much, looking at all his sons and daughters, a new generation would soon rise up, and soon, he would also soon take his place under the ground, and one day meet his father. Under Nala, Ayana and Zahara, the cubs looked around with curious eyes. After the ceremony, Asafa had lots of meetings and gatherings to take care of, so he only arrived back in the pride den in late hours, when the skies had turned dark. He found the cubs in the arms of their mothers. He couldn't help but to feel pride and joy. Thinking back to the times when he was a lost youth, and now, he was king and had lots of children. He is in the phase of his life where it's soon time to teach and prepare the next generation of kings and queens. Another three months flew by and by this point, the cubs had started exploring and running around. Asafa spent a lot of time playing with them as he found it absolutely amazing how he had gotten himself kids. The cubs weren't allowed to leave the lion's den yet, as it was dangerous for them, so Asafa had to spend time inside whenever he had time over. Asafa laid on the ground with all the small cubs around him. He was looking at them and inspecting them while they experimented with their abilities. Simba and Kiara were the two that seemed as if they were on drugs, as their energies never depleted. Asafa chuckled at this, Nala was the most energetic as well when she was younger, sadly, the belief of his and Simba's death changed her into the calm and mature one. This led to Ayana becoming more childish and challenged to her older sister. Asafa thought back and remembered how Ayana was the calm one. Although their personalities had changed much, their genetics didn't. Nala's kids were energetic and challenging to look after, while Ayana's children, Mahadu, Mufasa and Amamu were the calmest. Zahara's children, Zawadi seemed to want to copy Kiara, while Tukufu was the one that Asafa was the most worried about. He had a look of intelligence in his eyes. But there was also something else, Asafa saw a hint of bitterness in his eyes as he watched his brothers play. Asafa hoped to one day fix this, so his child doesn't grow into becoming the second Scar. Flap 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 your majesty bad news Azu flew in, and as usual, he seemed to be frightened and in panic. Zazu, calm down. You aren't young anymore, you need to relax more. The Safa said with an eye roll. This bird seemed to love being dramatic. No time your majesty, another lion pride is on the attack. Again. Who is the fool this time? A Safa said to himself as he stood up. It's a scary looking lion warrior with a scar on his eye, and he has even lost his tail. Zazu cried out. Sigh if he doesn't return, he'll lose more than his tail. Asafa said as he walked out. Simba was walking to the pride lands with his new pride, although he was in a confused state. A few months back, he decided to meet his brother and the crew in the forest, but to his surprise, he found no one there. At first he panicked but his pride calmed him down, telling him that they'd help him search for his brother. Simba was left wondering why his brother never searched for him, or why he had left the forest, but he tried to stay positive, believing that Asafa must have had his reasons. In the end, they made the forest their base, and everyone helped search for any information or sign of Asafa. It took a while but two of the lions searched near the pride lands, and there a gang of lionesses found them near the borders and got ready to attack. The two lions backed off saying that they had no intention on crossing the borders, and explained how they were searching for a lion called Asafa. This surprised the lionesses. They got even more wary and told them that Asafa is the king of the pride lands. The two lions looked at each other in confusion, even they knew what territory the Pride Lands were. It was the biggest land in all of Africa. So after they returned, they told Simba of their findings, thinking that it was just a coincidence that the king was also called Asafa. But Simba fell into deep contemplation, and then later explained who his real identity was. This caused an uproar amongst his new pride, but in the end, it didn't matter, as he was their leader now. Simba felt confused and reluctant, knowing that his brother had returned to become king. 
Asafa why did you return? And what happened to our uncle? Simba wondered. He suspected that something must have happened in the Pride Lands which forced Asafa to return, because he knew that Asafa, just like himself, had no intention of becoming king. In the end, Simba decided to return to the Pride Lands and ask Asafa himself, and he'd figure out the rest of the plan, after hearing what Asafa had to say. This is how Simba found himself at the borders of Pride Lands, with his new pride, about 9 to 10 months after he regained his memories. As they neared the borders, his pride stopped, looking hesitant. Simba looked at them confused. What's wrong? He asked, not understanding why they looked reluctant. Invading into someone else's territory is often a sign of an attack. One of the older ladies explained. Yes, it's better if we stay here and wait for the king your brother to arrive. Another lion added. I didn't know that. Simba admitted. He hadn't been educated on matters regarding lions. Or rather, both him and Asafa had been educated, but he didn't care about those matters when he was young. He felt like those lectures were unnecessary, so he never listened when Zazu or his father tried to teach him. Simba then decided to stop and wait until his brother would come here, so that no misunderstanding would happen. Simba walked to the elderly and the young to make sure that they'd were fine after traveling such long distances. The truth was that he should be on guard, waiting for his brother, but he was too nervous, so he distracted himself by interacting with the elders and the young. As for Asafa, he hurried to where Zazu had found an invading force, and he had a bunch of lionesses behind him. Soon they came to the borders, and there Asafa found a pride waiting. But what made Asafa frown was that the majority of the attacking force were elderly and young, not fit to fight at all. And none of them seemed aggressive. So he slowed down and started walking towards the pride to figure out what's going on since they didn't seem aggressive. Who is your leader? Asafa asked as he neared them. All of them stilled in fear as they saw Asafa, it was the biggest lion they had ever seen, his mane but their senses were too far gone, so Asafa coughed to gain their attention. Only then did they move out of the way to show their leader, a lion without a tail and a scar above one of his eyes. When Asafa saw him, he stilled, this time, he was the one left completely aghast. The lion in front of him looked like a completely copy of his dead brother. Did father play around with other lionesses back then? Was the only thought circulating Asafa's mind. Zazu saw how Asafa seemed out of it, maybe Asafa had become scared because of this unknown lion's scary Yakuza look, with his scars and no tail. Zazu flew beside Asafa and looked arrogantly at the sky. HMPH, not going to greet the king of the Pride Lands. Let me educate you on. But as he was about to scold the lions, the lion with scars stepped forward and cut Zazu off. Long time no see Zazu. Simba said, before moving his sight to his brother. Zazu halted his speech and suspiciously looked down to the lion in front of him, that's when he noticed it. Mufasa. He asked suspiciously. If Asafa could come back from the dead, can't his father as well? Aren't you going to greet your own brother? Simba said with a cheeky grin as he nervously looked at his brother. Impossible. Asafa said as he took a step back. He had seen his brother's place of death, he had even seen his brother's tail his tail. Asafa noticed that the lion in front of him didn't have a tail. In his mind, he was certain that his brother was dead, so right now, confusion was of the highest order. All the lionesses looked at Asafa, wondering what was going on, as they hadn't met the king's brother before. They wondered why their king seemed so flabbergasted. What do you mean impossible? Simba retorted with a mock tone. After all this while, and his brother could only express impossible, you died I saw your tail, Asafa said as he still felt that this was impossible. Oh I lost my tail in that incident, and I think I hit my head, because I also lost my memories for the longest while. Simba said awkwardly as he scratched his head with his claws. But he did finally feel some kind of relief as he realized that his brother believed that he had died, which means that he had betrayed him or left him behind. Otherwise, why would Asafa stop searching for him, and why would he move back here while his brother was lost? So Simba did worry about what actually had transpired after he lost his memories, and right now he was relieved to know that they actually believed he was dead, otherwise they wouldn't stop searching for him, and they wouldn't move without him. Asafa finally accepted that his brother was alive, so he rushed towards him and hugged him in happiness, Simba showed the same brotherly love back. Although Safa was joyful at this, but he felt like Simba had changed somehow. 
the Lions of Pride Land had assembled for a meeting that was called by their king. Simba stood beside Asafa, as the pride, they sat in around them, listening. The small pride that Simba had brought with him sat behind him while looking nervous. Asafa had introduced and explained Simba's identity to everyone, and the most joyous was Sarabi, she had both her sons back. But that left a new problem, Simba used to be the crown prince, and now that he's alive, what would happen to Asafa? That was the worry of the pride lions. There was also the fact that Simba had brought his own pride of 12 lions that wanted to join their pride. Not only were all of them old, young and or weak, but they would take a large portion of their food reserves and would need protection. Adding so many lions that couldn't help the pride would only become a burden on them. So all of them were in worry right now with what would happen. The truth is, I never had the ambition to become king. The crown always belonged to my brother, and he should take my place as the rightful king. Asafa said after many minutes of awkward silence, they all looked shocked to hear the words of their king. He had thought deeply about this, and this was the best solution he could come up with, so there would be no chaos. Asafa this is not acceptable. Because of circumstances, you are our king now, and rightfully so, the title of crown prince is not definite, but the fact that you are our king is. Sarabi walked forward to retort him. She disagreed with his decision. Furthermore, Mahadu is the crown prince, we can't change that after the ceremony has taken place. Ayana also stepped forward and spoke her mind. Asafa, I agree with mom and Ayana, and seeing the expression of everyone else, I'm guessing that they do as well. Simba also spoke disagreed with Asafa. Asafa looked at his brother in surprise, Asafa always assumed that Simba wanted to become king, but that he had only hidden that ambition ever since escaping the pride lands. So the fact that he simply accepted his brother as king without any bitterness about it, stumbled Asafa slightly. Seeing his brother's facial expression, Simba felt that he had to clarify. I know I wanted to be king, but that was when I was a cub he started saying as he looked around. But that ambition died, and truthfully, I was always jealous of you Asafa. Simba said with a smile as he looked at his brother. Because I always knew that you'd make a better king than I could ever be. Simba said, he continued as he saw that Asafa was about to retort to that. You're way more mature than me, smarter and stronger. If I had to choose one between the two of us, that should be king, it is without a doubt, you. Simba stated before sitting down again. I see. Asafa said, he offered the king's crown to Simba, because he didn't want any bad blood between them. Asafa did love his brother, and he would rather be prince than allow any bad beef between them. And truthfully, now that Simba had come with his own pride, Asafa was slightly worried that Simba would seek out the throne of pride lands as well, that thought did hit him as he realized that his brother had returned. And if Simba did seek kingship the traditional way, of challenging the king to a fight, then there were only three outcomes. The best outcome would be a similar situation to what happened to Mufasa and Scar. Scar challenged Mufasa in their youth and lost, gaining the Scar he became known for, and his original name was replaced by his new nickname, Scar. Even though Scar lost the fight fairly, he could never overcome the loss. And the bitterness led to their relationship worsening day by day, until Scar became what he did. The second outcome is that Asafa would have to exile Simba from the Pride Lands after defeating him. And the worst case scenario, Asafa would have to kill his own brother. He would never lose against Simba no matter what, not because he wanted to be king, but if Simba did challenge him for the throne, and one Simba would have the right to kill his sons, and take his women as the new king. Asafa didn't think Simba would ever do such a thing, but he wouldn't allow for Simba to be in a situation where he had any possible chance of actually being capable of doing that too. His family, therefore, Asafa would never concede if Simba wanted to challenge him. That's why there are only three outcomes for such a challenge, and that's why Asafa chose to rather give the throne to his brother, and take the easy way out, although it is the easy way out, it is also the most beneficial to Asafa, since he didn't care about being king, he never did. He wanted to live life as royalty and enjoy riches, while his brother worked hard as the king, sadly, his dreams stayed just as that, dreams. But to his surprise Simba didn't want to be king. Furthermore, I have been a leader for a while now, and it's too much responsibilities for me, I enjoy the life of Hakuna Matata Simba laughed out. Sai Asafa sighed as Simba understood how wise Asafa's own ideas were. Fine, then there only one matter left to take care of. Asafa said as he looked at the 12 lions Simba had brought. 
We can't and shouldn't burden ourselves with them. Sarabi was the first one to speak her mind again. She was one of the elders and had handled political matter for a long time, so her wisdom was well respected, and everyone nodded at her words, agreeing with her. If they can't stay, neither can I, I took them in, and I promised them security. Simba stood up for them and argued back. Asafa, look at them, there's almost only elderly and two cubs. There's only two young males amongst them capable of fighting and working for the pride, if we take them in, it will only burden the pride lands. Sarabi reasoned, she understood that it wasn't just about what was moral, Asafa's first responsibility was their well-being. Both Simba and Sarabi turned to Asafa, waiting for his choice. Haven't you all lived through the worst of times? Asafa asked rhetorically. All of the lions looked at each other. How many years did they survive under Scar's rule? Didn't you survive without any food at all? He asked again. We are lions that have survived famine, so why should you fear eating a bit less and sharing food with others? Asafa said. His words did hit them hard, as they knew that they could handle this little hurdle. Since Simba has accepted you, then from now on, I'll also accept you. Asafa said to the twelve lions. All for them cried out happily, they were outcasts, unwanted by their individual prides. So they were joyous to finally have a real pride with territory again. The cubs were also cheering happily, not really understanding what was going on. Thank you for your mercy your majesty. One elderly lion bowed down. No need. Asafa said as he walked to the cubs. I have a few cubs younger than you too, would you like to play with them? Asafa asked them with a big smile. They calmed down as the giant lion stood in front of them. They simply nodded nervously. Ha 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 that would really make me happy. Asafa laughed out as he took a liking to the two cubs. Simba also smiled at this, since cubs were not liked by male lions that were not their fathers. Yet he felt like something was missing, where was the crew he had missed so much, Taiman, Pumba, Imani and Hamu. Where are they? Simba asked skeptically as he followed his brother. Calm down brother, you'll soon meet them. Asafa said, getting annoyed by Simba's impatience. He was taking him behind the pride rock to meet the crew, they had found themselves a good little place there. That's also something that always annoyed me, you call me brother this and brother that, why can't you just say Simba? Simba said with an eye roll. Asafa rarely said his name and always addressed him as brother, it's called speaking formally, didn't you listen to anything Zazu taught us when we were younger? Shall I teach you the basics of speaking? Asafa said. When Simba was gone, he missed him. And when Simba was here, he was annoyed by him. This is sibling love. HMPH, if I ever speak like you, just throw me into a volcano. Simba whispered to himself. Yuha how can I miss you so much, but then when I meet you, it doesn't even go two hours before you annoy me. Asafa said angrily. It's because you've got a stick stuck somewhere it shouldn't be. Simba said nonchalantly, his brother was always good and proper. Asafa halted and Simba just passed him by. At least I get to use my stick. Asafa finally said. This time it was Simba that froze still, and Asafa passed him as he continued walking. Come on now, we're almost there. Asafa told him to hurry up. As they arrived at a beautiful, small lake behind the pride rock, there was a good amount of green around it. Soon they walked over to the lake, and although Simba walked with confidence, he walked as if his soul had been ripped out from his body. A stick comment had gotten to him. Seeing the state his brother was in, Asafa sighed. It couldn't be helped, Simba was a virgin, and rightly so, don't take it personally brother, of you keep doing what you do for a few years, maybe you'll gain superpowers. Asafa said, trying to cheer him up. After all, as long as I'm beside you side dot dot no woman will give you a second look. Asafa realized in sadness for his brother. How what are you talking about? Simba came back to his senses when he heard Asafa's words, but he didn't understand them. Never mind, oh we're here. Asafa said as he perked up. And that why you should always listen to strangers. Taiman said in his wise tone as he was educating the cubs. The two cubs that were slightly older than Asafa's children sat there, listening seriously. No, Taiman, I think it is never listen to strangers. Pumba spoke from within the small lake as he was enjoying a good bath. Taiman stood beside the lake and educated the cubs. Imani and Hamu were also in the lake, enjoying themselves. No Pumba, you might be wrong here, why wouldn't you listen to stranger? They might have something good to say. Hamu argued with Pumba. 
But maybe they have something bad to say as well. Pumba pushed back. Or they might have something good to say, point is, you never know until you talk to them. Timon explained. The cubs nodded as they took in everything their wise teacher was telling them. Teacher, I got it, when I meet strangers in the future, I listen and follow them. One of the cubs was smart and fast on the uptake. Attaboy. Well done, today's lesson is over. Tomorrow I'll teach you about how to escape any responsibility that comes your way. Timon said excitement. Hakuna. Pumba said. Matata. Hamu continued on with even more excitement. Snore and Imani snored in excitement, she was so excited that she fell asleep a long time ago. What are you teaching the kids? Asafa asked in horror as he came close to them, Ah Asafa, finally, I've got some complaints about the food being served here, the bugs yesterday were quite dry. Pumba stood up in resistance, and when he stood up from the water, all the bubbles stopped. Smack Pumba you can't talk to Asafa like that anymore, he's king now. Timon said, then he turned to Asafa. Your Majesty, the bugs weren't just dry, they weren't tasty enough if this is not changed immediately, I will isn't that Simba. Timon got caught off guard as he noticed the lion behind Asafa. Simba, PFFT, Timon, might need some of that edu circle la circuitation you were giving the cubs. Hamu laughed Pumbo also laughed, but his laughter halted when he saw Simba as well. Guys, turns out he isn't dead. Asafa said with a happy smile. Simba waved at them. Simba all three shouted as they pounced at him in hugs. The commotion woke up Imani as well. Yawn why are you guys loud so early in the afternoon? She said as she looked at the sun's position. Then she looked down and saw everyone hugging someone that looked eerily similar to Simba. Oh, I'm still asleep. She said as she was about to close her eyes. But soon they widened in surprise as she realized that she wasn't asleep. Simba she shouted in surprise as she jumped out of the water and rushed to him as well, guys I missed you so much, Simba said as he embraced everyone. How are you alive? Pumba asked happily, and are you planning on competing for the throne with me? Let me warm you, even though I joyous that you're alive and well, I won't go easy on you. Hamu said as he slung around Simba's arm happily. They spent the rest of the day together, just as Safa, Simba, Timon, Pumba, Imani and Hamu in reminiscence. They laughed, cried, agreed and bickered, it was as if they were back to being in the forest as young carefree hippies once again. A-H-H I miss this. Timon said as he laid on Simba's mane. Indeed, this royal snake agrees. Hamu said from on top of Asafa. Finally, we have the good brother back. Imani said in relief, Asafa was always a source of worry for her, and Simba was way better in her opinion. Imani I always wondered how panther soup tastes like, don't make me actually go for it. Asafa said with an eye twitch. TSK, Asafa, don't be bitter when the truth has been spoken. Simba said. Oh right, Simba, have you met your nephews and nieces yet? Pumba asked. Nephews and nieces Simba stood up in surprise. Alright, I forgot to tell you Asafa said in realization, there's even this one cub that has the same name as you. Timon said as he relaxed another year had come and gone. Things had developed well for the Pride Lands, but for Asafa's personal matters, things were looking weird. Asafa was very worried about one specific person Simba. Simba had spent his time living life behind the Pride Rock with a crew sure he did go on border patrol and mark their territory with Asafa, but the thing that worried him is the fact that Simba and Imani had been spending more time together, Imani was like an annoying elder sister that cared deeply for Asafa, but Simba and Imani hadn't developed the same sibling relationship. This hadn't gone without the notice of Asafa. And now Asafa is worried that Simba had developed a Black Panther fetish. That is very problematic, lions should only mate with lions. If Simba brings home a black panther as his partner, how will Sarabi react? Sai Asafa sighed as he thought about this. He liked Imani like his own family, but how could he accept her and Simba together? They aren't even the same species. What's wrong? Timon asked. Timon, Pumba, Asafa and Hamu were laying on the grass, looking at the night sky. Asafa noticed that Simba and Imani was gone when he arrived here, and that's why he was worried. Do you guys think something is going on between Simba and Imani? Asafa finally let his worries get known. Oh. You know, when a lion and a panther spend a lot of time together, their brains can get mushy. Timon explained. So there is something between them? Asafa said with worry in his tone. But Asafa, this should be something good for you. 
Pumbus said. How so? Asafa asked skeptically. Well lions and panthers can't have children. So Simba won't have any children that'll create political problems with your children later on. Pumba 1000% of his brain power, creating a miracle, a reasonable argument. Asafa stood up surprised, in fact, that was something he was worried about. He didn't want to forbid Simba from having his own children, but that could create big problems later on. But this. Could solve all his problems. Come on, lay down again, let's continue enjoying the big dark thing up there where the fireflies are stuck. Pumba said as he described the sky as Taiman had once taught him. Asafa laid down again and enjoyed the night sky. A few days later, Asafa woke up early in the pride den, the sun hadn't risen yet, and sky was dark. Asafa woke and looked at all the cubs laying down and sleeping in weird positions. His eyes shifted between each one of his cubs until it reached the biggest cub, a pale furred lion cub with hints of dark mane on his head. Mahadu, the firstborn son of Asafa and the crown prince. Asafa lovingly looked at all his children with care, but today he was going to teach Mahadu some important life lessons, so he nudged the cub to awaken him. Mahadu tried to wave away his father's paw as he tried to continue his sleep, but Asafa nudged him again, making Mahadu open his eyes, and looked around with a hint of confusion as he just awoke. He found his father put his finger on his mouth and make a shhh sound as he waved Mahadu to follow. Mahadu looked around and saw that all the others were sleeping, so he understood that his father wanted only him to follow, so he silently stood up and carefully followed his father out of the den. Ayana woke and saw both Asafa and Mahadu were walking out of the cave, she smiled as she trusted Asafa, and was happy that Asafa would spend some alone time with his son, so she went back to sleep. Asafa walked out and found a slight breeze to the wind. He looked up to the sky which was still dark, and the stars were still visible, yet at the horizon, light was starting to shine as dawn had come. The sun hadn't risen yet, but it was getting closer so the horizon lit up. Beautiful isn't it? Asafa said to his son. It's just the sky dad. Mahadu said, still sleepy. Is it just the sky? Asafa said in a chuckle. Mahadu looked up in response, but this time he tried to see more. He saw the stars shine bright, but what more is there? There's also stars. Mahadu guessed that's what his father meant. Stars ha follow me. Asafa said in a smile. Asafa walked down the pride rock and continued walking to the savanna. They walked for a while before they came to a big lake. Asafa stopped and sat down when the lake came into their sight, they were still far from the lake. Mahadu followed his father and sat down. Mahadu looked up to the sky again, trying to figure out what his father was talking about, since it seemed like his father knew something he didn't and was playing mystical. But no matter how he looked, he couldn't figure out what his dad was playing at. Mahadu. Asafa said in a serious tone. Mahadu looked at his father, giving him his full attention. Asafa looked at his son as well, he was very content with Mahadu being the crown prince. Asafa had observed his children since their birth, and he had found that Mahadu was the calmest and fairest to his siblings. He never picked on his siblings and ignored them when they were bickering with him, he was also overly protective of the other cubs. Whenever the others got into trouble, Mahadu willingly took on the blame, so they wouldn't get harshly told off by Ayana, Nala or Zahara. He was also slightly bigger than the others, although by not much, and whenever they ate, Mahadu secretly made sure that all his sibling ate enough before he himself ate his fill. The Safa looked at the lake where a group of gazelles, giraffes, elephants and even birds were drinking. All of them had already woken up and started the day before even sunrise. Look Mahadu, gazelles, Asafa said. Mahadu turned his head and his eyes searched for the gazelles and found them. What are they to us? Asafa asked, his tone serious as he wanted Mahadu to understand that he was teaching him something important. Mahadu thought for a minute, but he could only come up with one answer, food. He asked. Asafa chuckled. They are food to the other lions, but not to you and me, can you guess why? Asafa asked. Mahadu thought for another minute, and the only thing that made the two of them different, was that his father was the king, and he was the crown prince, but he didn't see how that had anything to do with the question asked. Asafa saw that his son seemed deep on thought with a heavy frown on his face, but he also seemed perplexed by the question. Asafa smiled. To the lions they are food, but to a king, they are subjects that we must protect. Asafa said as he looked at the gazelles. We must protect them. Why, don't we hunt and eat them? 
Mahadu seemed bewildered by the answer his father had given him. Yes we eat them, but what would happen if we ate all of them? Asafa asked. Mahadu's face lit up in understanding. Then there would be no more gazelles for us to eat, and we'd starve. Mahadu said as he realized. And that's why, we protect our borders, if other lions come here it'll eat not only the gazelles, but all other animals that is our food. Asafa said. Mahadu seemed to look at the gazelles with understanding. As kings, we must make sure that the animals that live in the pride lands are always protected from other predators, and as kings, we must make sure that we don't hunt too much of what we have, if we do, we will doom the other animals and ourselves. Asafa said seriously. Seeing that his son kept silent and understood, he continued. Look. Asafa said as he pointed at the gazelles, making Mahadu once again focus on them. The gazelles that were drinking all halted as they seemed to hear something, all of them suddenly started running as their ears picked up something. See how the mothers are the last ones, as they make sure their children are not left behind. Asafa asked. Mahadu nodded. That's because they also have love for their families and friends. They have their lives and their experiences. Asafa whispered as she bowed down to Mahadu's level. Mahadu seemed to understand as his eyes widened. So we eat them but we must also make sure that they can continue living in peace as well, Mahadu whispered. And not only do we eat them, they also. Asafa stopped here and looked around to make sure no one was close by, as if he wanted to reveal something huge to his son. His son perked up his ears as Asafa came closer once again and whispered, they also eat us. Mahadu turned his head and looked very skeptically at his father as if he had gone mad. Hahaha <laughs> Asafa laughed out as he hugged his son closer. God stop it, you tricked me. He said as he felt tricked by what his father just claimed. That's when Asafa calmed down and grinned at his son. I didn't trick you, this is the great secret of the kings. Asafa said in a cheeky grin. Yeah right. Mahadu said with an eye roll, yet he was still content with what he had learned today, it was something of great importance. Mahadu, I'm not joking. Asafa said suddenly. Huh? He turned to his father with a frown. I am the king of these lands, and I protect it and eat from it what I need to survive, but one day, I'll grow older and I'll die. Asafa said seriously. Mahadu's eyes widened. What? Dad, I don't want you to die, promise that you won't leave me. Mahadu expressed fear and worry Mahadu. Let me tell you something that my father once told me, look at the stars. Asafa said in his deep wise voice while looking upward. Mahadu followed his gaze and looked up. The great kings of the past looked down on us from the stars Mufasa explained. What, really? Mahadu said as he stared at the stars. Asafa secretly looked at his son, and when he saw his expression, Asafa chuckled as she remembered how his father had this very talk with him and Simba when he was younger. Yes, and one day, you'll take my place as king. So whenever you feel alone, remember that those kings will always be there to guide you, and one day, so will I. Asafa said, he sat beside the much smaller Mahadu as they both looked up, staring at the stars. By that point, my body will become earth, and turn into grass, which the gazelles consume to survive, and you'll be protecting them while I'll be feeding them. Asafa said. Mahadu turned to his father and finally understood. This is the circle of life, and one day, your son will take your place, and you'll be looking down on him from the stars. Asafa said. Mahadu understood, and he looked down while tilting his body towards his father. Asafa hugged Mahadu closer as they sat like that until the sun rose. When the time had come for them to return, Asafa gave final advice for his son. Mahadu, always remember, being king doesn't mean that you're able to do whatever you want, it means that you oblige to protect these lands. Asafa said. Even if I don't want to? He asked. You can't avoid this, you are part of these lands, and this is part of you, just like I am part of you. He said in a smile. Mahadu looked a bit confused, but seemed to get the gist of it. Seeing the confusion on his son's face, Asafa put a paw on his head. You will understand when you are older. Asafa and Mahadu returned to the Pride Rock, and the lions had awoken. Asafa continued his duty of strengthening the borders and taking care of matter regarding the Pride Lands. The cubs played as usual, but they all noticed that their eldest sibling seemed out of it. They even found him staring at an ant nest, just looking as the ants worked and ran around. Mahadu had learned something great, the circle of life. 
with his new understanding of how other animals also have their lives, families and ambitions, he found great interest in other animals, an interest he had never had before. Even ants seem so interesting to him now. The cubs looked at each other. Do you think his brain broke? Kiara asked. Maybe he wants to eat ants. Zawadi, the youngest girl answered. Oh who cares, let's play hide and seek. Simba said to his siblings. He was named after his uncle before they knew Simba was alive. Don't you think it's because of the secret meeting he had with father? Tukufu asked with a small frown. They all knew that Mahadu had gone on a small trip with their father, because he was the next in line. Who cares about that, let's play play play. Simba rolled his eyes. I'm just saying don't you find it weird that we weren't allowed to follow. Tukufu said. You're doing that thing again, overthinking. Mahadu is going to become king so it's obvious that father will spend alone time with him, Imamu said, getting bored with Tukifu's fixation. Imamu was the closest to Mahadu in personality, but he wasn't protective of his siblings, instead, he had a rivalry with them. Little Mufasa is the only one that seemed to not care at all. Let's go to Uncle Hamu's kingdom. Zawadi came up with a fun plan. They all agreed. They ignored Mahadu and walked toward the small lake behind the Pride Rock, where their funny uncles and aunt were. This place was named Hamu's kingdom, according to their snake uncle, Hamu. They always enjoyed playing with Taiman, Humba, Hamu and Imani. Even Simba, their uncle was spending most of his free time there. As they walked, Tukufu halted and looked back one last time at Mahadu, a look of bitterness flashed in his eyes before he turned around and followed his siblings. Tukufu has kept a secret, he found his siblings dumb, and he barely enjoyed their company, as they were always shouting and saying dumb things. Even his eldest brother Mahadu, who he considered the smartest of the dumb cubs, was someone he looked down on. And today he found Mahadu just staring at an ant nest without having the slightest interest in them, which made him feel that Mahadu was even dumber than usual. Why would someone like him be the crown prince, but not me? That thought had been on the back of his mind for a long while now, but today it had implemented itself strongly in his heart. A few weeks had gone by, and new worry had come to Asafa's attention. The neighboring leader Tukufu, father of Zahara and grandfather of Zawadi and Tukufu, had an invasion. He got badly harmed, and there are rumors of other lions that are eyeing his position. Asafa understood that if Tukufu was harmed, he would neither be able to protect his pride, nor his position. The animals were often moving between territories, and a few of them had been to Tukufu's territory before they came here with the news. Thanks for the news, you can go now. Asafa dismissed the birds that had come with the news, they nodded before flying away. Asafa turned around and went back into the den where Zahara was resting, he looked at her, but didn't know how to break the news. Zahara. Asafa said as he walked in, gaining the attention of the resting lioness. As her ears perked up, she opened her eyelids and turned her head as she looked at her king in wonder. Asafa walked beside her and sat down. I've got bad news. He said, which made her sit up. Your father was injured in a battle not so long ago, it seems serious. Asafa said and let her pick up the underlay meaning. She looked at him, and he could see the hint of worry in her eyes. Will he be fine? She asked, her tone seemed slightly nervous. I don't know she seemed like she lost her words for a while as silence overtook them. After a little while she looked at him again. Do you think it is possible to visit him? She asked. Asafa frowned while thinking. They couldn't just walk into their territory, especially since the king seemed to have lost his authority, but seeing the worry on her face made Asafa want to find a way. Sigh fine I'll find a way. Asafa said as he stood up and walked out. Zazu. Asafa shouted as he walked out, hoping the bird was around. Soon a blue bird flew towards him in hurry. You called your majesty? He said as he landed near Asafa. I need you to fly to Tukufu's territory and send him a message. Asafa said. Yes, I'll do it now. He said, wanting to fulfill his command. Just as he was about to fly away, Asafa interrupted him. You haven't received the message yet. Asafa chuckled. All right, sorry about that. He said awkwardly, if birds could blush, Zazu would be blushing right now. Tell Tukufu that I'm visiting with his daughter in three days. Zazu nodded before flying away. Asafa chuckled slightly at the fact that Zazu was always very fast to listen to orders. Asafa wasn't sure what to do about the situation, this is the life of lions. 
you grow into your prime, you're strong, then you grow into old age, and the young overpower you but in the end, even though Tukufu gave away Zahara, his own daughter for the sake of the pride, Zahara didn't feel bitter about it, she understood the life of lions, and she still held respect for her father. Asafa would honor his wife by allowing her to visit, although this is very dangerous. Right now, there is a political shift in Tukufu's pride, and he might get usurped any second, if they arrive at a hostile environment, Asafa can't guarantee to protect his wife while being attacked by many opponents. He would be fine, but even he can get overwhelmed by numbers, allowing the hostile lions to attack his lioness. Later that day Asafa took off with Zahara towards the neighboring lion pride. Asafa left Simba in charge of the pride lands for as long as he was gone. It took them a few days to reach the borders of Tukufu's territory, at that point Asafa stepped forward and roared a mighty roar, so that they would be aware of the fact that they were here. A normal lion's roar can only reach 8 kilometers, but Asafa's mighty roar could reach about double that. Which is why, when the lions of Tukufu's pride heard the roar, they thought a mighty beast had come to life to destroy the world. All of them felt their instincts shout at them to not fight this superior beast, and submit for the sake of their survival. Only Tukufu understood what's going on, so he stood up and walked with his weak legs, as he tried to go to he borders. Many of his pride eyed him with suspicion and greed as they saw him walk, only one lion seemed to look at him and worry. One male lion walked forward to Tukufu. Leader, where are you going? He asked in worry. This was the same lion that was held by Asafa's strong jaws when Tukufu tried to invade the pride lands a few years earlier. Had his leader Tukufu not acted fast and made a big personal loss, he would have died. From that day onwards, he had become very loyal to Tukufu. The others in contrast only felt their greed overflow when they saw that Tukufu had become older, and had received heavy injuries to his legs, he had lost his ability to fight, and soon, a restructure of the lion hierarchy would take place. So everyone was on their toes, this affected not only Tukufu, but all the members as they seemed to be on their guard. Many fights broke out between different lions in the pride. This was normal for a pride, everyone has their place, they know who is first to eat of their food, and who is second, third and so on until the last lion. But since there will soon be a new leader, the whole structure is showing off their might, so they can get as high of a status as they can. The only reason Tukufu hadn't yet been overthrown was because many of the lionesses were his daughters, and a few were his sons. But even they were looking on with greed. King of Pride Lands has cometh to visit me with his queen. Tukufu said as he kept limping forward. Leader, allow me to receive them. He said worriedly as he saw his leader struggle with walking. Then, so shall it be. Tukufu looked at him and said before turning around. The male lion hurried to where the roar had originated from. All the lions looked at each other in surprise, they had heard what Tukufu had said. This was a cause of worry for them, since a legend had been passed around these parts, ever since the failure of Tukufu to take over the Pride Lands. The lions returned humbled and in loss, the leader had even given away the only three females that had not gotten pregnant, including his own beloved daughter. Soon, the lions spread what had happened in their battle, and legendary stories about the King of Pride Lands spread, but most lions just took them as that, stories. They believed that the warriors had come back and exaggerated their stories, so that they wouldn't look so shameless for their loss, after all, what lion is as huge as a mountain, and can fight one hundreds of foes. But the roar they had heard made all of them feel a shiver in their spines, and the ones that felt the most fear was those that had fought Asafa directly. One of them had four big scars on his neck where his mane refused to grow out, he was on of those that was looking at Tukufu with greed, but right now he was worried, because he knew the truth about Asafa's strength. Even if all their pride attacked Asafa, they might be able to defeat him, but the first end to attack will die for certain, that's how strong Asafa is. Everyone looked at each other, feeling that things might become complicated. Asafa saw the lion that had come and received them, and recognized him, but couldn't put his finger on it. That's Olaf Cinder, one of the lions you defeated. Zahara whispered, she once belonged to this pride and recognized most of them. What a weird name he has. Asafa thought. Asafa looked at the lion and saw that he seemed to have recently grown into his prime as a young adult lion. The others you defeated were Arthur Pendragon, Lemmy Winks, Fallen Ant, Au and Alexander. She whispered. Asafa looked at her with one brow raised, their name were very odd. They are brothers and came from another pride, their father was king. 
Their father lost his mind in his last years and named his cubs as such. When they were old enough they were thrown out of the pride. She explained their story. No wonder they have such weird names, their father was a mad lion. Asafa responded. Yes, his people might not have been happy with him, but his battle capabilities were not to be underestimated. He defeated five prides in battle before being killed. He was a warlord and was great at battles, in fact, his territory was even bigger than the pride lands for a short while before he died. She said with a hint of respect. Her father had once told her the story of the mad lion. And even he respected the mad lion's capabilities in war. Sadly, the mad lion loved war too much and died in it. Oh, too bad I never got to fight him in battle, Asafa said, wanting to see how good this mad lion was. She looked at him weirdly. What? Asafa asked her, seeing her expression. It was your father that defeated him, along with his brother. Zahara said, making Asafa halt, the truth is that he barely knew about his father's reign, except for the rules and laws he had set forth. Didn't you know? Your father is famous for stopping the mad lion. She said while looking, Asafa said in his defense, but she gave him the eyes that told him that she didn't buy it. Soon they arrived in a place with a big lake in the middle of the savanna. The lions were resting under a few trees that had grown around the lake. When they arrived, Salaf Cinder showed them the path to Tukufu. Asafa felt like everyone was looking at him like he was a celebrity. There were even a few cubs that pointed at him while shouting look mom, it's the lion monster. But he did his best to ignore it. Asafa time has flowed by since the last we saw each other. Tukufu was the first to speak when they saw each other. Tukufu was laying under a shadow a bit further from the others. Asafa nodded, feeling weird about the way that Tukufu spoke. Father. Zahara spoke in worry as she hurried to his side to show her worries. Little flower, you have groaneth. Tukufu said in a calm voice as he finally met his daughter again, there was a hint of relief in his voice, as he saw that she was well. He had heard that she became the child bearer of Asafa and one of the queens of the Pride Lands, which made him relieved that her fate had been good. But even then, as a father, if he couldn't see his daughter he would worry. Seeing how well she looked, and the fact that Asafa himself brought her here, meant that he cared for her. That was one of the few worries he had about meeting his end, he worried about his daughter's fate. But now he felt. Like he could die at peace when that day comes. Father, I've heard that you're hurt, is it true? She said worriedly as she inspected his injuries. It not but a scratcheth. He said, trying to make less of his injuries so that she would not worry, but both Asafa and Zahara saw through his lies. Is it truth that I have grandchildren? Tukufu asked, wanting to confirm the rumors, but also wanting to change the subject. Zahara lit up. Yes. Zawadi and Tukufu. Our daughter and son. She said happily telling him about the two. Asafa sat silently while his wife and father-in-law spoke for a while, although it was mostly Zahara that spoke while Tukufu listened patiently. When the sun was about to set, it was too late to leave, so Tukufu offered them a place to stay. Asafa accepted the invite, so that his wife could spend more time with her father, after all, this might very well be their last meeting. When the morning sun had come, Asafa woke up. Looking at his wife that was sleeping heavily, he smiled. She had stayed late into the night speaking with her father. They even spoke about when Tukufu was young and met her mother and all kinds of nostalgic topics. Asafa noticed that Tukufu had come to their resting place. I need to speaketh with you. Tukufu said in a low voice as he didn't want to wake up his daughter. Asafa nodded as he stood up before following the limping lion to a more secluded place where others couldn't hear them, but close enough that they could keep an eye on Zahara. I have it a favor to asketh. Tukufu said. Asafa nodded, willing to hear him out. Recently, one of the lionesses birthed my latest child. Tukufu revealed. No one knoweth that I am the father, but I worry about his fate after I'm goneth. Tukufu said. Asafa understood his worries. Tukufu wanted him to take the cub with him, so that the cub wouldn't be killed when they found out that Tukufu is his father. Asafa thought about it for a second before speaking. I can see that you are no longer capable of leading a pride with your injuries and age. So follow me to my pride, live with your grandchildren and newborn son there instead. Asafa said finally. This could have big consequences, but as he saw how Zahara spoke so happily with her father, he was willing to do this. Tukufu, a man that never smiled, chuckled when he heard that. It would be an honor, but it would also be honorless of me to leave my pride. 
to Khufu said. I became a king at a young age, and I grew our smalleth pride to the size it has today. I was born here and I shall perish here. If they want to be king, they will have to do it over at my dead body. Tukufu said, with each word, his tone became more serious. Asafa looked at Tukufu and fully understood. As a king, Tukufu could never leave his pride. Then it is a loss for both your and my pride. It is unfortunate that your grandchildren will never meet you. Asafa. Tukufu nodded, agreeing. That is another wish he had, to meet the cubs of his daughter, alas, he still received a big gift. The gift of meeting his daughter a last time. Although, my son Tukufu carries your name, I am afraid that his personality mirrors that of my uncle. Asafa admitted, hoping for the older lion to share his wisdom on the matter. Tukufu frowned at this. Everyone knew of how Scar went against his father's wishes and challenged Mufasa to a fight for kingship. But the fact that it was Scar that killed Mufasa was a scandal that only the lions of Pride Land were aware of. Tukufu understood his words as Asafa's son was greedy for the throne. My uncle killed my father and tried to kill my brother and I. Asafa revealed the truth that his uncle wasn't just greedy, but also had darkness inside of him. Tukufu now fully understood Asafa's worries. Tukufu thought it through. My advice is that you should speak it with little Tukufu. Discuss his inner demons and make sure to quench it, Tukufu said. Asafa nodded, but his worries weren't that big since he knew that he had received the Super Lion Serum. So he knew that he would most likely even outlive his children. Lions didn't live longer than 15 to 30 years, but Asafa knew that he would most likely push that limit because of his superior body. Although he planned to make Mahadu king at a ripe age, he would still stay around and enjoy life as he watched over them, that was his plan. But he still didn't want infighting between his sons. And if Tukufu is as scheming as he seemed, he might find a way to make more trouble than Asafa was willing to face. Worsted situation. Banisheth him from the pride, this is the destiny of many sons of lions, Tukufu finally gave his last advice. Indeed for lions it was the norm to cast out the young male lions before they reached adulthood. Then they would wander around until they find a new pride where they can either live as an underling, or they'll fight for the leadership. Asafa nodded, hoping that it wouldn't come to that. After waking up, Zahara spent her time around Tukufu while talking to him happily about everything. Asafa saw this and felt that she knew that his time was soon up, she was just pretending to be happy, as she wanted her last memories with her father to be positive. When midday had come, it was Tukufu that finally told them it was time to return, Zahara looked at him like he had betrayed her. Come on dad, we just came here, I've missed you lots we can go tomorrow, right Asafa? She said, her tone was if she was trying to be strong. Little flower a kingdom cannot function without its kinjith its time if you shall return. Tukufu answered her. This was because he knew that the longer they spent time together, the harder it would be to split apart again. Last time when he sent her away, it was one of the hardest decisions he had to make. Zahara's happy facial expressions finally broke like glass. She didn't want to cry, but she knew that today was the last time she would meet her father, and she did her best until the end. But there was no helping it. Tears fell down her face as a pained expression overtook her. Little flower, why shall you waste tears? Tukufu tried to comfort her. Dad I I will miss you a lot. She said, trying to not face the truth of their last meeting. And I willeth miss you. Tukufu said in a smile as he put a paw on her head. She nodded in understanding as she cried. Zahara, a day will come when you'll say goodbye to your own cubs, would you then want them to feel so pained by your goodbyes? Or would you want them to feel gratitude for every moment that you got to spend together? Asafa said. His words echoed wisdom as they touched her heart. She understood that being happy for the time they had together was better than being sad for the time they wouldn't see each other anymore. She nodded and collected herself before a bright smile overtook her face. Thank you daddy for everything. She said to her elderly father that it always seemed like an invincible hero to her, yet at this moment he seemed so aged and weak. Dukufu, the man that rarely smiled, smiled more today than the last five years combined. A smile graces his face. It was a pleasure, little flower. He said, it truly was a pleasure for him to raise such good children, Zahara included. I'm glad we could meet up as friends in this life. Asafa said before turning around and taking the lead in leaving. Zahara was about to follow her king, but she turned around and rubbed her head on her father's head one last time to show her affection. 
Then she hurriedly ran after her husband and king. When Asafa and Zahara reached the borders, they found Salif Cinder waiting for them with a cub beside him. Zahara looked with suspicion at Salif Cinder, not understanding what he was up to. But Asafa simply nodded to Salif Cinder and walked up to him as he looked at the young cub that seemed to shiver in fear. What are you up to now Salif? Zahara said which skepticism, believing he was up to no good. Salif just looked at Asafa, for him to clarify. You can go now. Asafa said to the lion. Salif nodded before turning around. Asafa looked at Salif Cinder, and saw how the lion took strong strides. His loyalty and kindness seemed to make him look a bit weak, but as he walked, Asafa saw a strong warrior in him. Maybe he will be the next king. Asafa thought, indeed, Salif was in his prime, and he seemed strong and kind. He would make a great leader. Salif. Asafa said, halting the lion in his steps as he looked back. If one day, it comes to it, and you're a leader of your own pride, know that there'll be friendship between our tribes. Asafa said in support. Even Zahara looked at him surprise. She knew Salif as a cub. He was someone that longed for adventure and danger, always claiming that those terms were siblings, and that's why they sounded so similar. She wasn't aware of how much the lion had matured since they lost against Asafa, nor his loyalty to her father, she only knew him as an unruly cub. But she trusted Asafa's judgment, so she said nothing of it. Don't worry little one. You're safe with us. Asafa said as he petted the little cub. So who is he? She asked. The last legacy of your father, and your little brother. He said in a smile before picking him up, carrying him with his mouth. Zahara's jaw dropped. What's his name? She shouted in surprise. He doesn't have one, no one knew that he is Tukufu's son. Asafa mumbled, hard to speak with a cub in your mouth. But Zahara got the gist of it. Then he is a precious jewel Kido will be his name. Zaharan said as she looked at his pure eyes, full of innocence and curiosity. He was born not long ago. Asafa smiled in agreement to the name. On their way back, Asafa asked Zahara why she didn't ask her father to go with them to the Pride Lands. She chuckled with sadness in her eyes. My father led that pride with pride, and will die with that pride with his pride, that's his personality. It would be useless to ask him to come with us. She said. Asafa smiled at how accurate her understanding of her father is. But he chose to not tell her about his interaction with Tukufu and what they spoke about. When they returned, they introduced Kido to everyone and made feel at home. In the end, it took a week before the news of Tukufu's death reached them. Zahara wept for her father, but as time passed on, they continued their lives. Asafa looked at his sons as they had begging faces. They had grown a lot during the last three years. They had all developed manes, although thin. Their bodies had the size of female lions. Mahadu was the biggest, and he was slightly bigger than a female lion. Come on dad, don't be such a bore, allow us to go hunt these beasts. Simba roared with a hint of challenge. The only beast I see is the one in front of me. Nala said in a chuckle as she looked at her son. TSK. Simba looked away. Ha brother, how unsightly, maybe you should just find a hole and bury yourself to spare me this drama. Mufasa said in a mock tone, clear to everyone that he was trying to sound like his brother Tukufu. And maybe you should join him. Tukufu said with annoyance clear in his voice. The other siblings laughed at this. Come on Tukufu, you're always so bitter, this is our chance to prove ourselves. Imamu said as he brought Tukufu into a hug. Please brother, spare me this drama. His words halted as he realized that he did indeed sound the way Mufasa had tried to portray him. PFTTTT ha 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 Tukufu you're too easy. Mufasa laughed the loudest, but all the siblings laughed. TSK. Tukufu was not happy being the butt of the joke, especially by his dumb brothers that seemed to lack a few up there. Even Asafa chuckled at the antics of his sons. Father, this will be a good experience for us. Even Mahadu, the wisest of his sons agreed. Dad, it's not like we'll be alone, Uncle Simba will be leading us so he'll keep an eye on us. Mufasa said in his last attempt. Sai fine then, you'll follow your uncle's command. Yesterday, a big group of crocodiles invaded their territory, trying to make the big lake of the Pride Lands their new home. Asafa would have allowed them to seek refuge in his land, however, they were overbearing and killed lots of animals in their way, so Asafa was about to lead a battle against them, but his sons wanted to go in his stead, without him as they wanted to prove themselves. 
Asafa knew that they had reached an age where they should go out to fight and start accumulating experience, so that they can grow strong. But he couldn't help but to worry still. To him they were just recently the baby cubs crying for mommy's milk. They had grown too fast. Simba just then arrived with two male lions that had come with Simba to join this pride. Asafa, we're ready. What's going on here? He asked as he saw his nephews gang up on their dad and mothers. They'll follow you instead of Asafa, make sure you take care of them. Ayana said in a chuckle and a hint of mischief in her eyes. Don't tell me she's telling the truth, Simba asked his brother. His nephews were too much for him. They always came to challenge him and to fight. They bothered him every second of the day if they could. Yes, brother, I'll leave them in your care. Asafa said as he turned around. Simba's face fell and Ayana grinned happily. Asafa, no, I mean, my favorite brother, please think this through, they are too young and trouble flows in their veins, it's better if I go with you instead. Simba pleaded with his heart. Then they're a perfect match for you. Asafa said as he continued walking back to the pride. He wanted to train his sons to protect the pride lands without his intervention. Lions are one of the apex predators. They don't fear any other animal. Only a few animals are stronger in a one-on-one -on -one battle, such as bears and tigers. Both of those animals are bigger and stronger. Tigers are even more skilled in one-on-one -on -one combat. The major difference is that tigers live and hunt alone whilst lions live and hunt in groups, so no tigers nor bears would mess with a lion, because if there's one lion, there are a few others happy to join in on the fight. But even then, a male lion in its prime is still an apex predator that isn't much weaker than a tiger or a bear. A one-on-one -on -one fight between those animals might end up in a loss for the tiger or bear, although it's more likely that a bear wins against a lion, and a tiger wins against a lion. Asafa is the exception to this. He felt like he could take on five tigers, maybe even more and still win, although, he had never pushed himself, and actually didn't know his limits, so if he joined the battle against the crocodile invaders, his sons would not experience true war and true battle, as they would be guarded by him. So he left them under Simba's leadership. Asafa climbed up the pride rock and followed his brother and sons with his eyes until they couldn't be seen anymore. They'll be fine, they've grown into young adults, it's time for them to learn these matters. Nala said, trying to calm him as she noticed that he was worried about his children. You're right, but you know how easily they get into trouble, maybe I should follow them secretly. Asafa said. Or you could follow me. She said as she started walking into the den. Asafa halted and looked at Banala as she walked into their pride cave. His eyes went from Nala to the her eyes and where his children had gone, then back to Nala again. On second thought, they're already old enough to handle such things, as men, they should face enemies head-on without their father holding their hands. Asafa whispered before following Nala. Just before he walked inside, he called out to his most most trusted aide, the Bluebird. Zazu. Yes your majesty. He seemed very pleased to be called out, it was as if he was hiding nearby, waiting for Asafa to call him. Zazu, follow my son secretly and keep an eye on them. He said as he walked inside. Yes, sir. Zazu said as he flew away. Asafa enjoyed his day with Nala and the others, while his brother and sons were out fighting for the pride lands. He only did this for the sake of his sons, so that they'd grow stronger and gained experience of real battles, and definitely not because he wanted to have some grown-up fun with his wives. A lion can never have too many cubs, this is hard work that must be done for the survival of the pride. So whilst his brother, sons and the other two males were out fighting hard, Asafa was at home fighting hard, in his own way. Asafa yawned as he stretched after working hard today, and just as he was about to take a good nap, a black panther hurriedly walked into the den. Asafa. She said worriedly without the hint of joke she usually had in her voice. Imani, what is the matter? He asked as he noticed her worry. The sun is setting. Simba and the others have been gone too long, I'm worried that something might have happened. She said in worry. Asafa stood up and hurried out of the den to confirm what she had said, and indeed, the sun was about to disappear into the horizon, as the sky had turned orange. Imani followed him out. Asafa was speechless, had he been so preoccupied with his wives that he hadn't noticed how much time had flown by. Simba and the others went on their mission long before midday, so Imani was right. Too much time had passed by. And there is no sight of them? He asked to make sure. I've been waiting ever since they left. Imani said in worry. Alright wait here. 
he said as he ran down the pride rock at full speed. Imani was about to follow, but she couldn't, he was too fast. She just looked on wide eyes as he sprinted towards the horizon in full speed. Why does it feel like he could easily outrun a cheetah she whispered in shock. She had seen him run before, but he always kept his speed so the others could follow, this time he went full speed. Asafa ran with all he had, and his stamina didn't seem to deplete. However he didn't have to run for long before he saw his sons, brother and two other males, form the pride all walk back, while some were limping. Simba. He shouted to gain his attention. A few were limping, but the worst of all was to Khufu, he had lost some of his feet, and he was bleeding heavily. Simba was carrying him. What happened? Asafa asked in a serious tone as he saw the state that Tukufu was in. He saved us, that's what happened. If it wasn't for him, at least three of us would have died. Simba said with admiration but also worry. Asafa frowned, that didn't sound like Tukufu at all. His eyes went to Mahadu to see what state he was in. Mahadu was halting as well, but he seemed fine except for some scratches, and that his head was lowered in sadness. What about the crocodiles? Asafa asked. The details of what happened can be further discussed later. Dealt with. Simba said in a heavy tone. It seemed that he had also sustained injuries. Let me take him. Asafa said as they all helped put Tukufu on Asafa's back. Soon they reached the pride rock where the other were waiting. All of them came forward in worry, including Imani and the crew. Everyone, move aside. Asafa commanded. His son was bleeding out so he didn't have time for their worries. Taiman, Pumba. Asafa said. Both of them hurried forward looking worried. Yes buddy. Taiman asked as he observed the injuries. Do you remember the method I taught you to start a fire? Asafa asked. Of course. Taiman said, not understanding why Asafa was asking for that. Then please start one as soon as possible. Asafa said as he laid down to Khufu on the ground and pressed on his leg, hard, to stop the bleeding from where he had lost his foot. The others looked on while being confused. Taiman and Pumba hurried, doing their best to start a fire. It took a while, but in the end, a fire was lit. Simba, take my place, put your paw here. He said. Simba came forward and did as Asafa said, not understanding why. Asafa saw that blood started flowing from Tukufu's wound. So he used his paw to push down Simba's paw. Use this much strength, see how the blood stops flowing. If it starts flowing again, press harder, don't be afraid to harm him. Asafa said before moving away. Simba was shocked at what he was seeing. You can stop bleeding by pressing the wound. Asafa ran around looking for a football-sized stone with a flat surface, when he found one, he picked it up with his mouth and brought it to the fire. He put it into the fire with the flat side up and waited. Everyone was confused. Soon the rock got really hot. Asafa splashed a drop of blood onto the rock, and when he saw how it got burnt, he knew the rock was hot enough. Move out of the way. Asafa said to Simba as he picked up Tukufu. What they all the witnessed shocked them to the core. Some of Asafa's children even looked away. Asafa put his son down near the fireplace. Simba, Imani, come here and hold down Tukufu, no matter what happens, don't allow him to move away. Asafa said somberly. They walked forward and did as he said, still not understanding why, but they trusted Asafa. Asafa took a big breath and looked at his unconscious son. Hold on, this will be painful. He thought in worry. Then he picked up the leg that Tukufu had lost his foot on, and put it to the burning rock's flat surface. Instantly, all of them looked with horror. Tukufu woke up shouting and roaring, trying his best to escape the pain. Asafa didn't allow him and kept burning the wound. Asafa saw that Tukufu had bled profusely, and if they couldn't stop the bleeding, then his son might lose his life, and Asafa wasn't willing to allow that, and this was the only plan he could come up with. Zawadi, Simba and Imamu started shedding tears as they saw their brother in so much agony. Only when Asafa saw that the injury had been completely burned, and there was no bleeding left, did he let go of Tukufu. At this point he had passed out again. Everyone was looking in horror. If I didn't stop the bleeding, he would have died before sunrise. Asaf said with exhaustion. Putting his son trough so much pain exhausted him. Simba take him to the den, and no one is allowed to disturb him. Let him rest. The rest, only his siblings are allowed to sleep beside him, but keep silent and don't disturb him no matter what. Asafa said. Before turning and walking away. 
They saw that he was pained by what had happened so they didn't follow him. Imani walked up to Simba and tried to comfort him, it seemed like what had happened had even shaken him. Asafa walked to a secluded place and started wandering in circles, he was waiting until Zazu revealed himself, to get some answers. I don't want to think bad about Tukufu, but it isn't his style to sacrifice himself for others, what really happened he kept wandering in circles as he pondered. Soon Zazu landed beside Asafa looking worried. What really happened? Asafa asked. After following them, I found Simba discussing with the crocodiles, trying to get them to leave the Pride Lands. It seemed like he wanted to get them to leave without violence. I assume that the crocodiles didn't agree. Asafa said. Indeed, soon a fight broke out. The lions were overwhelmed by numbers, but they did seem to hold on very well. He said, but at the end he seems to become hesitant. What's happened then? Zazu is not certain if he should speak on supposition. Zazu said. The next part, he wasn't sure if he saw it correctly. Speak. Asafa said. Tukufu was fighting from behind, but it looked like he was keeping an eye on the battlefield and moving from different spots. That put his siblings and the other lions in dangerous situations, Zazu said with uncertainty. Was it intentionally? Asafa asked with a heavy frown. It seemed so from where I was Zazu said, he understood how big the claims he were making, and if he was wrong, he might be putting a big blame on Tukufu, that's why he felt reluctant to share this. But Zazu was also certain of what he had seen, it's just that Tukufu's intentions weren't absolutely clear, although it seemed like he was trying to get everyone on his team killed. Asafa was looking at him as if he wanted more details. He seemed to position himself and push the crocodiles into better formations, until the lions started getting overwhelmed. Soon everyone got injuries one by one. But your majesty, it might have been an accident. Zazu said with hope. Do you believe so? Asafa said with a flat tone. No. Zazu's head fell down in sadness. What happened then? He asked. It seemed like Tukufu miscalculated as a crocodile attacked him, taking him by surprise. Mahadu saw this jumped in front of Tukufu, he almost sacrificed his life to save Tukufu. Zazu explained. Asafa started walking in circles again, distressed by everything he had heard. Zazu looked at Asafa in worry, feeling the same distress. He had already survived a scar, he didn't want to see another one. Continue. Asafa said as he kept walking in circles. Tukufu seemed to completely blank out at the fact that Mahadu was about to sacrifice his life to save him, luckily Simba succeeded in helping out both of them. But the formation Tukufu had put the crocodiles in, gave the crocodiles an edge as they formed a crescent around them, Zazu looked at Asafa, who seemed to be in deep thought. They attacked Mahadu and Simba, they were about to be killed by six crocodiles, but Tukufu seemed to come alive and pushed his uncle and brother away into the perfect position to fight back, but he was attacked in their stead. The crocodiles halted in shock before one of them attacked and bit off his foot. Luckily, Simba and Mahadu were put in a good position to fight back as they had the other lions beside them. Zazu said. He saw that Asafa was furious at what Tukufu had done. But your majesty, it seemed like Tukufu regretted his actions. If it wasn't for his intervention, pushing Simba and Mahadu into a better position, which led to the fact that the lions could recover and in the end win. Most likely, all of them would have died. Zazu said, trying to explain how he saw repentance in Tukufu's eyes before sacrificing himself. They fought the battle for a long time before killing almost all the crocodiles, a few of the crocodiles escaped. And they sustained injuries, but they won in the end because this time, Tukufu seemed to position his siblings into a winning formation, at least he did that before passing out. Zazu tried to ease Asafa worries, but he himself wasn't so certain. That's enough Zazu, you can leave thank you he said before turning away and walking away. Asafa kept walking, he didn't know what to do. He should kill Tukufu so that a similar situation doesn't happen again, but at the same time, Tukufu was his son, and he sincerely loved him, not to speak of his other children, and Zahara who would all be heartbroken. But those Tukufu's repentance matter when the damage was still done. He did his best to save the lions in the end. But the damage was done and he almost killed everyone, intentionally. He wasn't sure what to do so he kept walking towards a big tree where a crazy monkey lived. After walking for a while, he came to the abode of Rafiki. What gives Rafiki the honor of the king's visit on such a lovely day? 
Rafiki's voice came from behind a sofa, as he was about to shout for the monkey. Ah Rafiki. Look at the stars, it isn't day. Asafa corrected him. He seemed to wise at times, and at others, he seemed slightly out of it. Seeing Rafiki did calm down Asafa slightly. No, no, it is daytime somewhere, it's you who can't see it. Rafiki said. Had another lion heard these words, he would have thought that Rafiki is crazy, but Asafa knew that Rafiki was right. The light might not be visible to you, but it doesn't mean that it's night, you're just looking at it from the wrong side. Waha you crazy monkey haha. Rafiki said before laughing like a madman. You're the crazy monkey here I need your advice stop playing around. Asafa said in a chuckle. Why would a wise king need the advice of a crazy monkey? He asked as he climbed up a branch and sat on it. Because even someone wise might fall into darkness, while the crazy one might see moments of light. But Rafiki disagrees. Rafiki said with a big grin. Asafa raised a brow. Didn't Rafiki tell you, you're in daytime right now, you see light. He said sire Rafiki, something happened today and I need your advice. He repeated again. You were in darkness before you realized your place in the circle of life, but you changed, and now you're different. Rafiki won't speak for the crazy monkey you were before turning to your senses. Now you're in the light, why would Rafiki give advice to the you in the dark? Rafiki said in a chuckle. Asafa was about to argue but stopped himself. Is this monkey telling me? That I shouldn't punish Tukufu for his evils when he was in darkness, but instead cultivate the light he has come, to Asafa came to a realization as he looked at the monkey in surprise. Have you realized it yet? Rafiki said. Asafa just stared at him in amazement. Rafiki jumped down and came closer to Asafa to whisper the complete truth to him. You are in a monolala chala trala yala yala banana nana hahalala. He started jumping around crazily again. Asafa laughed and realized that the wise monkey had given him another great advice. Asafa realized that he should try to make sure that Tukufu still has goodness in him, and if he does, he should work on magnifying that light. But only when he's sure that Tukufu is devoid of light, should he think about the death sentence or banishment. Haha <laughs> thank you Rafiki. He said before turning around and running back. He trusted the old advisor of his father who seemed to know more than he should, and seemed to know the answers to many things. As Asafa ran away, Rafiki halted in surprise, and just stared at the disappearing Asafa for a while. Hey didn't you come for advice? Why are you leaving before I can give it? The monkey asked flabbergasted. But Asafa had already too far to hear. Rafiki liked to play with the lions before helping them out, but Asafa ran away before he could give his advice. He just said some words of light and darkness to confuse the lion Rafiki stood there with his jaw slightly ajar. As Asafa had arrived close to the Pride Rock, Zazu flew to him. Your Majesty, where did you go? Are you fine? Zazu asked in worry. Don't worry Zazu, I asked Rafiki for some advice. Asafa clarified, what have you decided? He asked. I'll wait and speak with him when he wakes up. If there is goodness in him, I'll give him another chance, after all, he did sacrifice himself in the end, Asafa said before turning silent. And if there isn't? Zazu asked nervously, if he insists on walking in Scar's footsteps, then I'll give him the same ending as well. Asafa said in a colder tone. He didn't want to kill a son of his, but if it was to keep everyone else safe, he wouldn't hesitate. Two days passed on before Tukufu awoke. No one knew if he would survive or not, but luckily he did. All his siblings were relieved that he seemed fine, except for the fact that he lost a foot. As everyone celebrated, Asafa kept an eye on Tukufu. What surprised him, was that he noticed how Tukufu's eyes had changed it used to glint with greed and schemes, he used to hide deep thought behind those eyes. But now, it seemed to carry heavy guilt and sadness. Did he really change? Asafa wondered. He seems different, Zahara commented as she stood beside Asafa. He simply nodded. I don't know what you're keeping to yourself, but you know we'll be there for you if you need us, right? Ayana said as she noticed his expression. Nala just nodded. Asafa understood where they were coming from as they could probably read the atmosphere and understand that Asafa was struggling with something. But this wasn't something he was willing to share easily. After all, if Tukufu had changed for the better, then it might be better that those that love him aren't aware of his evil's deeds. So Asafa had to deal with this on his own until he was sure of what he would do regarding Tukufu. Everyone, leave, I need to speak with my son. 
he commanded to everyone, including his wives. What he was about to say to Tukufu, and what was about to be revealed, it was better for Tukufu's mother and siblings to not know. All of them looked at their father, they had just started celebrating. A few of them were about to protest, but when they saw the serious expression on his face, all of them looked at each other before leaving the cave. They realized that their father wasn't in a state where they could easily challenge him. Asafa walked forward to Tukufu while staring him in the eyes, yet, Tukufu couldn't meet his father's eyes as his eyes fell down in shame. Tukufu, I am aware of what happened because of you. Asafa said. Tukufu looked at his father in horror. Tukufu had always felt like he should be the next king. And although he held sentiment to his siblings, he felt like he was superior. That arrogance led to him slowly corrupting his view of his own siblings. In the end, one thought kept hunting his mind. The thought that if they disappeared, all his problems would be solved. This was a thought he tried to get rid of for a long time, but the older he got, the stronger the feeling got. And when they started the battle with the crocodiles, he felt his greed overtake him as this was a once-in-a-lifetime chance. His greed and impatience overtook him, until his plans failed due to unexpected move from a crocodile. And at the moment he was about to die, he felt something unexpected, he felt relief that his plan failed, and that his siblings might survive. After all, even though he held greed, bitterness and arrogance in his heart, there was also a dot of love towards his siblings. That little bit of love for his siblings decreased by the year, but by this point, it hadn't extinguished yet. And when he was about to die, he felt a hint of relief that he failed his plan. He had spent his short life looking down on his siblings, to the point that he had forgotten all the good times they've had, he had even forgotten how dear they are to him, it was at that moment he realized this. But the next second, Mahadu jumped in front of him, ready to die to protect him, and it was only at this moment that he came to realize the fool he had been. That was when regret and shame overtook him. For a second he felt like he was the scum of the planet. Luckily his uncle jumped in and gave him enough time to scan the area. He made his calculations and pushed both of them into safety, ready to die in their stead. By doing this he could at least make up for the stupid decision to kill his family, by helping them survive. This was the payment he had accepted, to give his life for trying to kill his brothers. But to his disappointment, he didn't die, no, he lived so he could carry this shame, this regret all in secrecy for the rest of his life. Maybe that was a fate worse than death. Maybe he deserved that. No, it gets worse, the one person he truly looked up to, his father seemed to see through it all. Although disagreed with his father's way of seeing things and his way of ruling, he still held instinctive respect and love for him. You almost killed two brothers and the others, I should kill your knight here and now. He said in angry tone. Tukufu's head fell down in shame. He couldn't look his father in the eyes. What should I do with you? If I banish you, you might come back in the future with more schemes, he said with a pause, waiting for Tukufu's response to that. Tukufu seemed to crawl into himself in shame when he heard that. He realized that if he hadn't come to reason during the battle, and kept being like he was, this was something he might have done for real. That's why he felt even more shame. Asafa smiled in relief seeing his son's reaction, feeling that there was still hope for him. Tukufu hid his face and couldn't see his father's facial expression. I can't leave you unpunished for the big crime you have committed against your own blood. So tell me what I should do, Tukufu. Death is the only punishment fitting for me. Tukufu said almost in a whisper. His tone was filled with shame. But I can't do that either, I couldn't never kill a beloved son of mine, Asafa said in a soft tone. Tukufu looked up in surprise, almost not believing what he had heard, until he saw the soft smile on his father's face. B but I tried to kill them. He said in fear, trying to push his father to see how he really felt. Mm. But in the end didn't you try to sacrifice yourself to save your brothers? Asafa asked back, his tone had changed from Asafa said as he started thinking hard. Tukufu sighed in relief, at least they could pay for what he had done. I know from now on, you are to demolish all ambitions you have for the throne. Asafa said seriously. Tukufu looked at his father again with side eyes. And then, you'll spend the rest of your life, to live as the advisor to your brother when he becomes king, and do your best to make sure that the pride lands prosper. This is your punishment, do you accept it? Asafa said a heavy tone that demanded respect and submission. Tukufu could only start weeping as he realized that his father had given him another chance to better himself. 
Before he knew it, Tukufu was dragged into a big hug. Tukufu, are my beloved son, and part of me, as I am part of you as are your siblings, your dot my legacy, Asafa said as he hid the weeping Tukufu in his embrace. One day, my turn to turn into dust will come, and you'll continue to carry my legacy. Can I trust you to protect what is left of my legacy when that day comes? Asafa asked seriously. He felt Tukufu nod his head, but he seemed unable to speak. Outside the cave, Simba sat down while listening in. He sighed feeling that it was good that he didn't become king. Asafa, I truly couldn't do what you do I'm sorry I left this heavy crown to you, but only you could do it. Simba thought in a sigh before standing up and leaving. If Asafa didn't say anything about this matter, then he would have no opinion about it. That's the trust he puts in his brother. Asafa took a walk with both Tukufu and Mahadu. A day had passed since his talk with Tukufu, and today he called out both of them to the test them. First he would give a final test to Tukufu to see if he truly had changed. At the same time, he would give the last test for Mahadu if he truly was fit to become the next king. I have something to reveal to you Mahadu. Asafa said. Father, if this matter only concerns my elder brother, then should I be in your company? Tukufu questioned. His tone had changed to a more respectful one, in regards to his brother. Although he limped, because of his lost foot, he could still walk in a pretty normal speed, although he couldn't run fast nor fight. It concerns you as well. Asafa said, before turning to Mahadu. Normally, I wouldn't reveal this to anyone, but you're the next king, and to make sure that you can safeguard this land against all obstacles, I have to reveal this to you. Both Tukufu and Mahadu looked at their father seriously. It's regarding what happened in the crocodile attack. Asafa said, looking at the expressions of his sons. Tukufu instantly felt a hint of fear in his chest, as he realized what his father was about to reveal. Tukufu took in a breath and readied himself for what was to come, the truth. But this is what he had done, and indeed, Mahadu deserved to know this. Tukufu was the one that sabotaged your expedition. Asafa revealed. He wanted to see if Tukufu was truly repentant when his evil's deed was revealed, would he find excuses or would he take responsibility for his deeds. At the same time, he wanted to see how Mahadu would react and respond, to see if he had it in him to be a king, Tukufu stared at his brother with a glint of intelligence that he had in his eyes, but this time there was no greed nor arrogance in his eyes, he awaited his brother's response. Mahadu turned silent for a while, thinking about what had been revealed. The truth is, he had noticed Tukufu's sneaky behavior during their battle, but he didn't want to believe the suspicions he had in his heart. In the end, Tukufu tried to sacrifice himself to save him. So Mahadu came to realize that he didn't care whether his suspicions were true or not, since his brother was willing to sacrifice himself. And it was his duty as the eldest brother to help his younger siblings. So Mahadu did what he had to do, and he didn't regret it. But having his father confirm his suspicions made him frown. Why did father tell me this? He wondered as he looked at his brother. Mahadu saw worry and hope in them. Mahadu understood that Tukufu hoped for his forgiveness, but at the same time worried how he might respond. Mahadu turned to his father. Why did you reveal this to me? He asked. As the next king, I want your advice on what we should do with him. Asafa said seriously that's when the gears in Tukufu's head started working overtime. His father had already decided what to do with him yesterday, which means he just lied about his intention to Mahadu, why? Tukufu first believed that Asafa revealed this to Mahadu, so that Mahadu could be aware of the potential threat that he was, but that didn't seem to be the case either, otherwise he would have said it in private or made his intention clear. That's when it clicked in his mind, his father was probably testing both their responses. Tukufu's face lit up while his eyes still carried that hint of intelligence. Mahadu also suspected that his father wanted something else, but he couldn't put his finger on it, in the end, he decided to play along. Tukufu, is what father claimed true. He ended up asking his brother. Indeed brother. I did have the intention to kill all of you he admitted with heaviness. After a few seconds of silence, Tukufu did something he had never done before. Brother, I'm sorry. Tukufu said, he didn't care about his father's test, right now, he was seeking the forgiveness of his eldest brother. Mahadu looked surprised. He knew the troubling personality of his brother. This was the first time his brother had sought forgiveness for something he did, and with such genuinely. 
Father, no matter what, in the end, he tried to sacrifice himself for me. I trust to Khufu with my life. Please have mercy on him. Mahadu ended up pleading his father. And what punishment would you give your brother? He asked. I would overlook it this time. Mahadu said. Asafa frowned. Some kind of punishment should given in such a case, even if it is only symbolic. After all, as a king, he had to make sure that there was law and order. Why? Asafa asked before jumping to conclusions. Because, right now, no one amongst my siblings know about this. I already had my suspicions, but I didn't say anything, because in the end, if this is revealed. I know that some of my siblings won't be able to understand and overlook this, Mahadu said as stood his ground. Asafa waited for him to continue. And revealing it might cause a rift between our sibling hood and the pride itself. There might even be mistrust between us. My siblings aren't wise enough to see these things. In the end, the pride itself might succumb to inner turmoil in the future, as the mistrust grows. I would forgive him and keep it as a secret, not only because I feel like he regrets his actions and has improved. Mahadu explained before turning his sight to his brother, whose face was shocked. I would also do it for the sake of future peace and harmony of our pride. However, if he does something like this again, I would punish him without mercy. Mahadu said seriously, right now, he was giving his honest advice as a future king, even though he wasn't sure about his father's true intentions. Maybe you're right. Asafa said before he started walking, neither confirming nor denying what Mahadu said. Tukufu was surprised to the core. He knew that he was the most intelligent amongst his siblings, but his arrogance had made him miss so much. He realized that even though he might be more intelligent than Mahadu, Mahadu's wisdom had reached places he could only dream of. Mahadu was thinking about the relation between the lions and the pride, and how it might affect the pride down the line. Dukufu had realized during the battle that Mahadu was more fit to lead the pride, because of his bravery and willingness to protect others, but now he realized that Mahadu was also the wisest sibling, and fit to lead as king because of that aspect as well. As for Asafa, he turned his back and started walking while hiding his smile that reached from one ear to another. He was happy with both their responses. His thinking differed from Mahadu's, but he was very happy with his mature answer. Asafa could punish as he wanted, because he himself could hold up the pride on his own, so for him it was easy to punish if he wanted to. But to Mahadu, even though he was the strongest and wisest amongst his group, he had siblings that were emotional and temperamental, that would act without caring for consequences. If Mahadu one day became king and there became a political disorder in the pride between him and his siblings, that could destroy the whole pride. So his answer came for preventing that. His answer was no less impressive than Asafa's own reasoning. Neither of their reasoning superior to the other. So Asafa really realized that his son had matured. In fact he had come to the conclusion that Motu was ready to be king, as he also showed his willingness to punish without mercy, if Tukufu did something similar ever again. A heavy load had been lifted from Asafa's shoulder as he felt that he raised good sons. Ha 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 ha. Tukufu started laughing crazily as he realized how blind he had been. Mahadu turned to his laughing brother. To think it would take me this long to realize how wise my eldest brother is, truly how foolish of me. Tukufu said in pure joy. The fact that he could understand such thing now, which he never could have before because of his arrogance, made him feel both refreshed and as a new person. Asafa kept walking with his big smile, leaving the two brothers to speak alone. He trusted both of them. When he returned he found unrest amongst the lions. Zazu flew to him with panic. Zazu, before you say anything, why does it feel to me like you are the bearer of bad news? Your expression better be like that is like that because you are constipated. Asafa said while shaking his head. Zazu halted with shock on his face. He didn't know how to proceed, he had urgent but bad news, but his king seemed tired of bad news. Just as Asafa was about to tell Zazu to tell him the bad news, Zazu spoke up. Ah got it. Zazu said happily. Huh. Your majesty I have good news. A chance for you to prove your worth has come. The crocodiles that escaped last time came back with a new force of 50 crocodiles and 30 hippopotamuses. This is your chance to become a hero and save your pride. Zazu said with pride as he came with good news. Zazu your punishment is to only eat snails for 10 days. Asafa said in a dead tone. Soon, Mahadu and Tukufu returned, laughing with each other. 
This surprised everyone in the pride, especially the siblings. But no one spoke about it as important matter was at stake here. Mahadu and Tukufu noticed the serious atmosphere and joined the pride. We have another attack. Asafa said, gaining the gasp of those that got injured. The crocodiles that escaped somehow rallied up an even bigger force. He said, all the male lions stood up, ready to fight. I want all for you to stand in formation on this pride rock, protecting it. The females should be last in line, protecting the young and elderly, as for the males you're up front. He said. I will be going ahead to try to speak with them. He continued, this statement gained the worry of everyone. No you can't go alone. Nala was the first to speak out and worry Asafa just rubbed his head against hers to show affection, but also to silence her. She purred. Don't worry, they can't harm me, in fact, I'm hoping for a fight with them. Asafa said, trying to calm them down. The truth is, lion cubs love playing as it is a way of simulating future fighting and hunting, which helps them train and prepare. And when they're young adults, they love fighting as their energy is at its peak. But as lions mature from that phase, they tend to become lazier and no longer enjoy fighting as they once did, and only do it when necessary. The Safa was in that state, he didn't feel the need to find exciting fights. When he was younger, he had to control himself his need to fight. But now that he is older, he enjoys just sleeping and taking care of his pride. But if someone seeks a fight with him, he would never deny that fight, after all, violence is in the blood of a lion. The Safa halted when he realized that his father had once spoke about something similar. A wise king doesn't seek danger, but is ready to face it when it comes to him. Asafa chuckled, yes he lied to his pride, he told them that he wanted to fight to calm them down. But truthfully, he'd rather that no invaders came to his territory to begin with. There's a high risk that I will fight them, don't worry too much, no one can stop me if I decide to leave, I'll dwindle their forces until they reach this place. Asafa said. They all nodded. Simba walked forward, ready to take up his position as the commander, while Asafa was gone. No, not this time. Asafa denied him with a smile, then he turned to Mahadu. Simba halted his steps, feeling awkward. Mahadu, you will take the lead while I'm gone, don't leave this place and make sure you protect everyone. When he said that, everyone got very surprised. Ayana was about to protest, she didn't believe that her son was ready. In fact, only Simba and Tukufu seemed completely calm about this. Father, it is wiser to let Uncle Simba lead. Mahadu spoke against his decision. No, it's decided, I trust you. Asafa said before turning around. Asafa ran down the pride rock and hurried toward the direction of the invaders. The reason he chose to fight them head on and alone was because this was a big force and the male lions hadn't recovered from the last fight. If they fight they might actually die this time. So he wanted to eliminate as many enemies as possible before the battle reached the Pride Rock. By that point, it wouldn't matter so much because the lions would have the advantage of being on the Pride Rock, so it would be an uphill battle for the invaders, while being a downhill battle for the defenders. While sprinting through the savanna, Asafa looked up and saw the clear sky with a burning sun. He saw the different birds flying thought the sky, freely as if unburdened by all troubles that seemed to infect the land. He saw giraffes walking in the distance and the elephants taking a cooling bath in a small lake on the other side. He saw gazelles running as they saw him, a lion. The Safa took in calm breaths as he sprinted he didn't feel tired at all, by pushing his body like this. His stamina was really great, especially considered that he is a lion. They are not known for their stamina. Usually, lions conserve energy by sleeping, and can sleep up to 21 hours if they need to. Lions don't have the best stamina, so the fact that Asafa can sprint and barely feel it is a great testament towards his great stamina. Soon he reached the battleground where he found a force of 50 crocodiles and 30 hippopotamuses walking towards him. Both of the forces halted as they saw him. The leading hippopotamus looked at one of the crocodiles in a smirk. What you promised seems to be true. He said with his powerful voice. One of the crocodiles stepped forward. I told you that we almost won the last battle. They're injured and not in a state to fight, that's why only one of them came. Don't forget our deal, we share the pride lands together after we conquer it. The crocodile spit out. Fine fine. Don't worry, let's just focus on taking over the legendary pride lands. I can feel my blood boiling just thinking about it. The leader of the hippopotamuses said in excitement. 
Asafa stepped forward with a frown, he heard what they've said so he understood that there would be no diplomatic outcome today. I am Asafa, the king of the Pride Lands, I warn you that if you continue, you will come to regret it. Just you. I've heard about your name Puny Lion King. I want to see the legends for myself. My name is Moto. The hippopotamus said with a grin. You five, go deal with him. He commanded five crocodiles. The crocodiles were confused whether they should take the order from this hippopotamus, so they looked at their crocodile leader that simply nodded. Five crocodiles arrogantly ran towards Asafa ready to rip him to pieces. Asafa looked at their slow speed, and when they closed by, he jumped towards the first one, stepping on his mouth, shouting it before he could bite him, then he jumped toward the last one and bit through his neck, instantly killing the crocodile. Everyone was surprised by his agility, speed and powerful bite. Before they could react, Asafa used the crocodile's slow turning ability to his advantage, and slashed the head of another crocodile. His claws went through the crocodile's head like a hot knife through butters. His crocodile brains was splashed forward. Asafa continued and instantly killed five of the crocodiles. All of them were startled and taken aback. The hippopotamus's leader had an ugly look on his face. Ten hippopotamuses stayed back, and ten of you crocodiles stay back as well, the rest of us will attack and encircle him. Moto commanded. He wanted to finish this as fast as possible before taking over these lands. That was a force of 35 crocodiles and 20 hippopotamuses that encircled Asafa. Asafa allowed them to encircle him as he could figure out what they were about to do. The rest of you, continue and attack the Pride Rock. We'll soon catch up and help you deal with the injured lions after dealing with this annoyance. Moto shouted. Hearing his command, the rest of the 10 hippopotamuses and 10 crocodiles continued towards the Pride Rock. Asafa was fine with this, because if all 80 of his enemies tried to reach the Pride Rock, there was nothing he could do to stop all of them. The battlefield would be moved to the Pride Rock, and that would make all the lions more involved than necessary. He hoped that his pride could avoid as much of the battle as possible, since they were still injured from the battle a few days ago. But it seemed like Moto used a large force just on him, so that they could kill him fast, before catching up with a small force, and taking over the Pride Lands. Asafa looked at all of them. A force of 20 went past him towards the Pride Rock, and of the remaining 60, 5 of them died in the first attack. Asafa didn't wait, he started attack them with full force, he didn't hold back at all. He would slash one crocodile and give a deadly gash that would either instantly kill him or would leave him incapacitated. As for the hippopotamus, they were harder prey, he had to use his biting force on them to kill them. He did use his claws to blind them, but it was not enough to kill them. The battle continued on, it took way longer than expected. Asafa was strong, but that doesn't mean that he's made of steel. If a crocodile or hippopotamus gets their teeth on him, he might at best break a bone and at worst lose a limb. These animals were known for their bites. So Asafa had to use his senses to the maximum to dodge attacks from blind spots and constantly sidestep or swerve attacks while finding moments to attack in between, which made this ordeal take way longer. Soon, 10 enemies were killed, then another 10, and then another 10. At this point, the Moto, the enemy leader, started to understand something. It was rumored that Asafa, the king of the Pride Lands, could take on 10 lions on his own and win whilst unscathed. During his reign as king, the Pride Land had been invaded multiple times, and these rumors started to spread to big parts of Africa, not only because these stories were so legendary, but also because it regarded the biggest territory, the Pride Lands. Then Modo started to understand that all those rumors were false. Asafa was way stronger than than any of the rumors he had heard. Modo saw Asafa jump off one hippopotamus towards another, pushing him down, then he slashed his stomach, and all of the hippopotamus's guts spilled out. Asafa stood and bit another crocodile, effectively killing him. Modo felt fear for the first time, and he started regret coming here. The damned crocodiles enticed me and tricked me. He felt bitter about it all. But it couldn't be blamed on the crocodiles alone, no, he himself was a person that loved showing off his strength and capabilities, that's a major reason why he had chosen to agree with the crocodiles. If he could conquer this land, he would get any lady he could ever dream of. Modo was thinking about retreating as he noticed that 30 of the soldiers had died already. Asafa kept an eye on Modo while fighting, he was slowly getting closer to the leader while attacking and dodging. 
That's when he noticed Moto's facial expression, and realized that Moto was about to give up. But Asafa wouldn't allow this. He needed to set an example for all future enemies. So he jumped over a hippopotamus and pushed himself towards Moto, using the force of his push, he continued bouncing on from different enemies, until arriving in front of Moto in less than 3 seconds, and taking him by surprise. Before Moto could react, Asafa jumped Moto and bit his neck with all his power. He had never before used all his might in his bite force before, so he wasn't expecting what happened next. Moto's head fell off. The battle stilled, but Asafa continued and killed even more. In the end, there were only less than five enemies left as they escaped in fear. Asafa allowed them to escape so they could spread what had happened here today. He looked around and saw the dead bodies of 55 enemies, the sight was gory as intestines, brains, spine and other organs had spattered everywhere. Asafa himself had blood all over his face as it dropped down from his mouth. His eyes were clear, but his face, paws and mane were filled with blood. Asafa looked around and found that in the distance, many animals had kept their distance, and observed what had happened. Even the birds in the sky were flying in circles to observe everything. Asafa took a big breath and roared so that everyone would know who he was. King Asafa, and his roar echoed into the horizon which shook the souls of everyone that heard him. He turned his sight toward Pride Rock and took a step, but that's when he felt a great pain in his leg. Looking back he saw that he was gravely bleeding. He saw his injury and realized that at some point, a crocodile must have bit his back leg. He hadn't felt it because of the adrenaline, but now that he calmed down he felt the severe pain that was coming in waves from his leg. Asafa realized that he must have broken a leg, but he didn't care as Pride Rock was in danger. So he hurried forward and ran with all his might. When he reached he pried rock, he was panting. At first he sprinted to his enemies, then he had his war with 60 enemies, which had taken a long time. Although Asafa didn't have a clock and couldn't tell how much, he was guessing that it took 30 minutes to 1 hour. Then he ran back with a broken leg, even he felt tired after all that. After all, lions weren't known for their stamina, yet he could do all this, which showed how much superior he was to not only lions, but all other predators. But running wasn't what made him pant, it was all the fighting. Fighting takes so much more stamina than running, you have to be fully focused, constantly move, react, attack, defend. It was a constant pushing of all his senses. When he arrived, he found that his pride and won against the 20 enemies, which surprised him. The pride were celebrating their overwhelming victory. The Khufu advised Mahadu and come up with a great war tactic, which led them to win without any death on their part. They were still tired after their battle, after all they still had to fight, but it went way easier than they expected. But soon they come to realization that Asafa was still out there, and worry overtook them. They were thinking about taking their numbers and helping Asafa, but in the end, Mahadu denied them and followed Asafa's command to wait here. It didn't take long before Asafa reached the Pride Rock while panting and slightly limping. When they saw all of them ran down to him and worry, Nala, Ayana and Zahara were the first ones down, followed by their children. They were all shocked and confused. They had never seen Asafa so vulnerable before, and even injured. Which showed signs of a great battle that must have taken place. But what happened in that case? Did Asafa escape the enemies, would they soon arrive with a force of 60? Or had the enemies come to some agreement with Asafa and left? Just as they were about to ask, Asafa smiled and passed out. It wasn't because he couldn't keep going, he could if he really wanted to. It was because it was the first time in this life that he had pushed himself this far, in addition to worrying about his pride, he felt exhausted. When he saw that everything was well and fine, he allows himself to fall asleep. Unfortunately for his pride, they didn't know that everything was fine, so they instinctively turned to Simba for directives. Why look at me, Asafa left Mahadu in charge. Simba sighed. Which made all of them turn back to Mahadu, but this time, they had full belief in his capabilities as he had proven himself today. Help father into the cave for rest. Well take up formation again, ready for the invaders to come any second. He commanded. They all climbed up the rock again. Zazu, I will leave the information gathering to you, hurry and tell us if the enemies are on their way. Mahadu said to Zazu. Zazu nodded and flew away. All of them started getting worried, although they defeated 20 enemies, there's a huge difference between 20 and 60. Furthermore, they had already battled and they were tired. 
Just standing guard and waiting for the invaders took a lot of stamina as they had to be very focused and ready. It didn't take long before Zazu returned with a very stunned expression, almost like he didn't believe his own brain at the moment. All of them assembled around Zazu waiting for his news. Defeated. Was all Zazu could say. Mahadu and the others frowned, many of them showing fear. Zazu, don't give up so fast, there has to be a way for us to win. Mahadu said with a frown as he looked toward Tukufu, hoping that he has a plan. Not us, them. Zazu shouted, not believing the information he had gathered. Huh? Has the bird finally gotten demented? Simba, Asafa's son said. Maybe he saw the force on its way here, and got so afraid his brain got fried. Imanu gave his own input. Mufasa kept his mouth shut, feeling nervous. His majesty defeated 60 enemies Zazu finally said, before falling down and fainting. Huh. 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 And all of them had the same expression. They looked at each other in skepticism. Now I'm certain the bird is demented. The younger Simba said in a scoff. Zazu sat up angrily. That's what I believed as well. But I ask the giraffes, the birds, the elephants, the gazelles, impalas, wildebeests and buffaloes, and I even ask the hyenas, but I received the same answer every time. King Asafa defeated an army 60 single-handedly Zazu said angrily before fainting again. Is that even possible? Mufasa asked, not believing it. He is our dad Imamu said, his idea of his father was the strongest and wisest lion. Asafa I've seen my brother in many battles, but I've never seen him go all out. Simba, brother of Asafa admitted. Then. Should we rest now, or keep watch in case it's false news? Guwais. The happy voice of Amirkut shouted as he rode a pig up to the assemble. Hamu has great news. The snake said proudly. We have great news. Imani corrected the shameless little snake. Seeing the tiredness and weariness on their faces, Taiman explained what was going on. We spoke with a few monkeys that passed by us, turns out that the lion we raised really lived up to our expectations. Taiman said happily. He defeated an army of 60 kilos. Pumba shouted in joy. No no no. Pumba, you're butchering it again, it's not kilos, it's foes. What am I to do with you? Taiman shook his head. All the lions started realize that Zazu wasn't completely mad after all, as they felt astonished, aghast, even shaken to their cores. And it's all thanks to how we raised him. I don't want to take the credit, but I did teach him to climb. Imani said proudly. Hey. I taught him how to eat 50 snails in 10 seconds. Taiman said, feeling offended. I taught him swine arts. Pumba said proudly. Haha <laughs> puny creatures a dark condescending voice echoed as they all turned their sights to Hamu, the super snake. It's because I blessed him with 1% of my true power. Wahaha the snake revealed the truth. Mahadu turned to his Uncle Taiman to make sure. Uncle Taiman, how certain are you of this news? It's not just the monkeys, we also asked a few birds, all of them saw the same thing. Taiman said with pride in his voice. The lions looked at each other. These smaller creatures might not understand, but 60 enemies, and it just any enemy but crocodiles and hippopotamuses. Tukufu was the one that felt the most awe, his brain had the greatest grasp on things. Mother, you take Aunt Nala and Aunt Sahara to observe the battlefield Imamu, go with them Mahadu said, before telling everyone else to rest up. The female lions are usually faster than male lions except for his father, who seemed to be the exception to the rule, that's why he sent his mother and aunts. Lastly he sent Imamu in case they needed male backup. He would have gone himself, but his father left him in charge, so he have to stay and care for the pride until his father wakes up. The others went back and discussed today's matter. But when it came to their king Asafa they were speechless. After a while, Nala, Ayana, Zahara and Imamu returned with shocked expressions, which confirmed everything they had heard. They saw what was left of the enemy force in the battlefield. They all realized something amazing, they were living under the age and reign of a king whose name would echo throughout the ages. He might be remembered as the greatest king of the Pride Lands, most would probably not even believe the stories that were about to be told about him. Event the siblings understood how great their father was, and suddenly they felt a heavy weight on their shoulders to live up to his name. Asafa's name did echo throughout not only the Pride Lands, but the news reached all of Africa. Most didn't believe it, but the news spread like a fire because of the amount of witnesses. 
In the end, most couldn't confirm it, but they couldn't deny it either because of the amount of witnesses. A few days later when the sun was shining brightly, Asafa had assembled all the lions. Asafa stood at the peak of the Pride Rock, looking over the Pride Lands with a smile. The others were waiting for him as he had an announcement to make. Asafa looked up the sky where the clouds were moving, and he smiled. Father, are you watching? He couldn't help but to wonder, but he could feel it in his soul. His father was always there. Asafa turned his sight to his children. Zawadi and Kiara had turned into fine hunters. Simba, Mufasa, Imamu, Tukufu and Mahadu had all matured and become fine young adult lions. They each looked at him as well, waiting for his news. Asafa turned his sight to his women, those that had given birth to his cubs, those that stood by his side, those that supported him almost blindly. Nala, Ayana and Zahara. Asafa smiled, Ayana and Nala had matured so much, not only since they were cubs, but since they reunited with Asafa as well. Their personalities were calmer and more collected, fitting for their statuses as queens. He looked at all the lions that were looking at him in admiration, and the elderly that were looking at him in appreciation. He looked at his mother, that had reached an elderly age. She smiled at him, beaming with pride as she looked at her son and king. She had aged to the point that she could no longer hunt, but as the former queen, she was still treated as one of the most important in the pride. Soon they all understood what they were waiting for. They saw how all the animals of the pride lands were flocking together under the pride rock. They understood that Asafa's news was greater than they expected. But what surprised them even more was the amount of animals that had come, the pride lands had probably never seen such a huge amount of animals that had come together under the pride rock, they suspected it was due to Asafa's new status as mythical lion, whose reputation had grown bigger than ever. When all the animals had arrived, a laughter resounded from behind them. Rafiki, you are finally here. Asafa laughed as well. The sibling were pleasantly surprised, their uncle Rafiki rarely visited, Rafiki smiled at him, but he turned his sights to Sarabi. Old friend, have you been well? Rafiki asked. Never better. She said, smiling back. The truth is that Sarabi had aged, she felt it. She doesn't have much time left. But she had no regrets about it. She had seen her two, beloved sons return to life. And then bring life back to the Pride Lands. She had seen them grow. She had seen her grandchildren be born and grow. She was very content. She knew that she got way more than most lions can ever dream of. And it seemed like Rafiki knew that today might be their last meeting. Rafiki is happy to hear that. He smiled mysteriously before turning his sight back to Asafa. Asafa turned to all the animals that had gathered. Today I will be stepping down as king. Asafa revealed, his calm, wise and powerful voice reverberated, and all animals heard him. And all of them raised their head in shock. The lions all felt the same, this had come as a great surprise to them. They wanted to protest this, but they couldn't in front of so many animals under the king. Rafiki was smiling as he knew all along. Mahadu, come forward. Asafa said without looking back. Although Mahadu knew that he would one day become king, he wasn't expecting it to be so soon. So he was stunned. Grandchild, hurry up. Sarabi's tired voice woke up Mahadu from his stupor. Looking back he saw his grandmother smiling brightly at him. Mahadu walked up. Father I don't think you should step down yet, you're still strong and in your prime. Mahadu whispered, hoping to change his father's mind. The truth was that for lions, their prime didn't last long, only three to six years. Simba was reaching the end years of his prime, he still got it, but he would in one to three years start to slowly age and become weaker. Asafa didn't have that problem, his prime would last for a long time, he felt it, in fact, he still felt that he wasn't at the peak of his strength. He was very close to it, but not quite there. He suspected that he would live much longer than the average lion, and that his prime was much longer than theirs as well. But he knew that it was time for the new generation to take over. He had done his part. When he came here, the pride lands were on the brink of extinction. He saved it for his evil uncle. He helped it flourish. He saved it from invaders more times than he could count. He made sure that the Pride Lands had successors that would protect it. He kept the throne for as long as it was needed. That's why he was smiling so brightly, he never wished for the throne, he never wished to be king. But it was in his blood, his destiny to become king. 
But now, he could finally let go of this responsibility, and let the new generation take over as he felt that he had done everything he should. He has nothing more to give as king, except to protect it from invaders, but his sons were capable of that as well. He didn't know the exact amount of years that had passed since he had become king, five, six, seven, maybe even eight. That was long enough, most Lion Kings held the crown for much shorter times. Looking back, he saw how Aana was smiling the brightest for him, followed by Nala. Those two knew him since he was a cub, and as soon as they heard his announcement, they knew that this was a very happy moment for him, and they were happy for him. Zahara was slightly worried, not understanding his decision, but seeing Nala and Ayana's reaction calmed her down, feeling that it might not be something bad if Nala and Ayana were so calm about it. Mahadu, the crown prince will from henceforth be the king of the pride lands. Asafa roared. Mahadu then followed and roared as the new king. Everyone bowed down to their new king, and the sun started shining brighter on Mahadu and Asafa. Sarabi was watching this while silently crying in happiness. Asafa looks a lot like Mufasa, but Mahadu is the one that really looks like a copy. Seeing her grandchild becoming king, reminded her of when her husband became king, and she couldn't help but to shed a few tears. Looking up, she saw that the sun was shining brighter than usual. She felt like Mufasa was watching over them and blessing them. Her days were numbered, but she was glad that she could at least witness this before her last breath. All the animals bowed down, even the lions did so before standing up and roaring with their new king. The Lion King's roar was important for the Pride Land inhabitants to recognize their king by. And today, they recognized a new king as the circle of life continues on. One year after the Asafa retired, the Pride Lands were more peaceful than ever. Asafa defeated 60 enemies by himself, and no one dared to invade this land anymore. Mahadu ruled with fairness and many that had lived long enough, believed Mahadu to be more similar to Mufasa than Asafa himself. As for the former king, he was behind the pride rock in a lake relaxing with his buddies. Haya this is the life. Taiman said, finally feeling like they were back together, the whole crew plus a few extra. He thought as he gave Ayana, Nala and Sahara a stinky eye. Those three were sitting further away, disgusted by what the crew was about to do. Ignore them Taiman, they'll never understand Hakuna Matata. Asafa said with his pure wisdom. Then he picked up another snail and slurped it. Asafa, don't think you can win this time. Pumba said with confidence as he also swallows a snail. Ayana felt like vomiting so she moved further away. PFFT, we kitties, this is how a real woman should be like. Imani said as she upped three snails. I was once the king to be, let me show you why that is. Simba said as he slurped four. Well, I was king. Asafa said as he slurped five. Well, I am king. Hamu said as he slurped ten. Sadly it was too much for him as he almost died. Diamond had to push out the snails by pushing his chest. Ha 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 they all laughed. But Asafa felt a hint of sadness, the amount of snails everyone could eat was lowering by the week. Asafa saw that Taiman and Pumba were aging, the same could be said for Imani as well Hamu was till in his adulthood and didn't seem affected. You know. We worried about you. Taiman suddenly said as he looked up to the sky. Me? Asafa questioned. Yeah whenever you came by, you had longing eyes, but you had to return because of your responsibilities. Taiman said. Asafa smiled, he didn't think anyone noticed that, but it seemed like those he grew up with knew him better than he thought. Why didn't you ever say anything? Asafa asked curiously. Wouldn't that make you more burdened? Taiman asked. Asafa was surprised. Indeed, if his crew asked to have more time with him when he didn't have it, it would make him feel very bad. It seemed like during the last few years, it wasn't just him that was holding back. Thank you, I couldn't have done any of this without you guys. Asafa said. No, you used your snake and created an army of lions, I think you could have done fine without us. Hamu spoke, not reading the atmosphere. Asafa turned away in awkwardness. As he stood up, a female lion came down the pride rock with one cub following happily. Grandpa I missed you the cub shouted before jumping into the lake towards Asafa. Asafa panicked and picked up his grandchild who didn't know how to swim. Be careful Zuberi. Asafa said angrily. I knew you'd save me, Gramps. The cub said happily. Asafa sighed, his grandson was half a year old, and the crown prince, but he was reckless. Mahadu had inherited his hardworking genes and impregnated four females. 
This was his firstborn, the others hadn't been born yet. But Asafa was worried, the crown prince was too fearless ah, you're back little cub. This time I'll teach you how you should never judge a book by its cover, that why you should always trust and believe in strangers. Taiman said. Taiman, if you don't want to end up as kebab, please be quiet, Asafa said. Asafa finally understood where Zuberi was learning his bad habits from. Father-in-law, I leave him with you guys for the night. The young female said as she walked back. This had become routine as Asafa and the crew loved having Zuberi over. Ah poor Zuberi, he's going to learn more bad habits here, Simba said in a sigh. Asafa looked at him and wondered if this was how their late mother used to feel when his children were cubs. He smiled at the memory of his mother. She died just a few days after Asafa retired, so they spent her last days together. Asafa picked up Zuberi, whose name was chosen in the memory of Sarabi as they sounded similar. Asafa smiled as he thought about how life kept going in cycles. They all walked towards the sleeping area and laid down in their spots. Ah, I miss this. Taiman said as he laid down in Asafa's mane, Asafa smiled as he had also missed this. This was his story, the story of King Asafa. From adolescence to adulthood. From a young cub, to a young, free-spirited adult with no responsibilities, to a young king with heavy responsibility to revive his pride and land, to a father and teacher. And finally to an elder that is retired and enjoys the fruit of his hard work. The story of King Asafa, son of Mufasa and the great king of the pride lands. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.